Okay, so it's much delayed. Uh, we apologize for that, as you guys can imagine, and I'm sure you guys are all experiencing. Life is um, unreasonably hectic uh, and trying to take on too many things pre-COVID, which were already going to be a push, uh, turned out to be an absolute madness. Oh, I can't see myself anymore. <sighs> absolute madness um, once this fall hit. Um, like I said, we have the kids home, uh, 24 seven, the last lecture we recorded, we were at least away cause we were writing the book. So my four year, our four year old started, uh, uh, junior kindergarten last week, virtually online. Um, so as much as we're doing it like this, uh, they're doing it. It's 25 four year olds trying to interact over essentially a zoom call, uh, for three hours a day, uh, five hours total of curriculum. So, so you can imagine we're losing our minds just a little bit. Um, so let's move on to today's lecture. Um, this one's kind of really fun. We've, we've given this before together, um, but not quite so in depth. We've, um, we've done it with pictures where we've just kind of told stories about different stairs, but we wanted to really give you guys, um, kind of the engineering process behind it and where it comes from. So, um, we're going to give you kind of the breakdown from the engineering part of the code, what goes into it. Actually, I'm doing all the talking. You haven't, you've just been kind of sitting there. Why don't you say hello to everyone, Dave? Hello, everyone. Dave here. It's good to meet everyone. And, uh, and we're looking forward to doing this. This is a very fun course. You can see that he talks my ear off 24-7. I never get any rest. It's just wah, 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 wah. Um, so we're going to talk about the stairs today and we're kind of, we've broken it down into a few segments where I'm going to go through, uh, what the code tells you from an engineering point of view, what to do about stairs. Um, it's interesting because it doesn't have most of the stair information in the code actually comes from the architectural component of the code, which is part three. I'm focusing on part four. We'll, we'll loosely talk about part three because we're not the experts on it. We've just been lucky enough to have done right. enough feature elements to have a, a kind of good sense of what part three entails. Um, the idea, though, is, is that you guys end up being the experts on that. And we're trying to tie in where the architect and engineer overlap on these feature elements. If you have anything you want to say, yeah. feel free to jump in. So we'll share anecdotally. We're going to show you some examples. We're going to share anecdotally where where based on our experience, things may be a challenge from a code point of view, but it won't be from a point of view of expertise on that section of the code. Yeah. Um, so we, we will, as Shannon said, you, we would expect that you would read that section of code. You guys are the architects. Um, but we're going to just sort of highlight, highlight the areas that we are aware that architects need to be concerned about and then specifically talk about structure. And, and because we do have slightly more experience, even still in part three, than you guys might just yet. Uh, kind of once you get out into the workforce, that would 100% be your role. But we kind of have the advantage that we've kind of learned a little bit of it just through experience. Um, then I am going to go through a few stair projects that I've done more or less from beginning to end and kind of some of the trials behind it um, and what we experienced. And I'll show you engineering models um, what the producibles were, um, and then Dave will, Dave's probably going to step off and do a little bit of work, um, getting both of us to kind of sit in front of a computer for two and a half hours. And fetch coffee. Yeah, he might be my coffee fetcher. Um, <laughs> Try yourself. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, then Dave will jump back in and the part that we've done before is really lots of images of stairs some that we've worked on, some that are just really cool from kind of precedent style projects to ones that um, we've found on the internet because they're just really freaking cool. Um, and Dave will kind of go through what the thought process is there. What's intriguing about that is we don't always know exactly what engineering they went into it. We can infer. And this is the same problem you guys always have with precedent, that you're looking at a few images and trying to back figure out a story of what they went through. Often enough, we have some really good insight. Even if that's not true for that particular stare, we might often have good insight that kind of develops out of it anyway. Um, did you want to stick around for a little bit or do you want to... I'm going to fetch coffee and, uh, and, and listen in. Okay, I'll take the coffee and then he'll come back in 
in a little bit. Um, we do have a doorway to where the four-year-old and two-and-a-half-year-old are doing school now. Um, so the likelihood of them running in my uh, the undergraduate and the graduate core classes had lots of appearances of my children uh, for le their lecture twos. Um, so you guys probably won't see as much of them. They might make a break for it every now and then. So stairs, stairs, and yes, more stairs because stairs was pretty much an entire lecture segment. And fair enough, there, there, there's some good engineering behind it. And where this is the first kind of one we're delving into, it kind of maybe gives us a chance to talk about things as well. So uh, let me get on this slide so my buttons work. Okay, so the things we're gonna look at is kind of what goes into designing the stair. And I'm gonna break it down into the different criteria we look at. So. What is the strength criteria for designing a stair? What is our serviceability criteria for designing a stair? And then what is our vibration criteria for designing a stair? A lot of the times, vibration isn't the governing design case for most things that we design in the building itself. Um, I, For those of you that have taken my core course, you've seen videos where vibration um, can have a really big impact, especially with that resonance um, or amplification feature. Um, this is, stairs often, depending on the type of stair they are, have a really big component that is governed by vibration. Um, and probably even 20, 25 years ago, engineers didn't look at it that much. Um, and you'd get complaints of bouncy stairs and it was more or less it's strong enough and it's stiff enough, so suck it up. Uh, that thought process is changing, um, especially as we get better at designing, which doesn't mean we're better engineers, but we have better software available to us that can do more and more complex and more and more refined calculations. So with that, we have more certainty in removing more material. And as we move, remove more material, um, as much as it's strong enough, and even if we've met our stiffness criteria, uh, we might have removed enough material that vibration starts to become more of an issue. So, vibration is something we look at quite heavily in stairs now. Although you might run into engineers that um, kind of a generation above me that are still working today and, and rightly so doing great work that might not find vibration governed. So, uh, you can sometimes find kind of this, this difference of opinion on how to go about these things. But I'll show you where the vibration criteria comes from. Um, we'll talk about stability loosely um, and then I will show you uh, we'll show you some images of basic stairs and then we'll go on to fancy stairs and the first few of those fancy stairs will be some projects that I've done um, guards and handrails we have a whole separate uh, kind of lecture module mini module that we're gonna talk about guards and handrails uh, because they don't always just go on stairs they kind of are their own component um, we can make use of guards and handrails. So you're always going to have to remember that you're going to have to check the guards and handrails, and we'll talk about that in the separate component. But sometimes we will make use of the guard within the design of the stair itself. And so I'll show you examples where we did that, but I'm not going to talk about the guard feature uh, design component of it at that time. We'll kind of wait and talk about that in the next module that we'll... Hopefully, if I can get my life together, uh, have that recorded by the end of the week for you. So uh, I wanted to show you an image of a stair heavily loaded. Um, this is probably as close as you get to 4.8 kPa live loading. Um, if you remember, uh, a kPa is one kilonewton per meter squared. So 4.8 kPa is 4.8 kilonewtons in a one meter by one meter zone. Um, and I always used Arnold Schwarzenegger because he was about uh, one kilonewton at 225 pounds. So that would be like having 4.8 um, Arnold's kind of jammed into a one meter by one meter square area. If it's a house, we can do 1.9 kPa. Um, if it is a house that I think is realistically going to kind of hold lots of parties, um, be rented out. Some of the houses that you, you see built in Toronto 
um, especially if it's a feature stair, like a real feature stair, and it's not just a, a one family home, but we're talking like 10, $20 million homes, I will often still treat the stair as a public stair, just be, for exactly this reason. You know, the photo op will always happen on the stair. Um, and so unless, and I will talk, I will talk to the architect about it. Um, and oftentimes they'll agree that this is going to end up being kind of a feature element. If I find that the load governs, um, detrimentally, maybe I'd backtrack that, but I design it at 4.8 for a lot of these cases because, uh, vibration governs anyway, we often find. If I find that's not the case, then maybe I'd reassess that. But if it doesn't hurt the stair to design it with 4.8, there's a real advantage to have that built into all the contract documents. Um, uh, so one of the things you have to think about often, um, and this is more where it kind of comes into the architect's scope, is fire rating. Is this fire rated? Um, does it have to be a fire rated exit? Um, and what are the implications of that? Um, so that's where you might have basically a boring stair because it cannot be exposed to the rest of the building. It's got to be cordoned off um, and uh, you can't see it all at once. You can't see it from the rest of the building, unless maybe you do like glass walls that have fire rating. Um, but often that's why you kind of end up with these real kind of um, kind of regular stairs in, in firewalls. Um, because why would you spend your money there if no one's going to really see the feature element? So that's where knowing what you need out of your stair becomes really important. The serviceability criteria, um, pretty, pretty standard. There's not, um, not really kind of any uh, outliers in that. Um, our dead and live is gonna be L over 240. I know I always told you that if there's finishes not susceptible to damage, um, L over 300 for some of the materials. Uh, often, L over 360 is still just kind of a good place to start. Um, what you don't want to find out is that you've done all this work and then they decide to come in and drywall it later. An industrial building is an industrial building. They're not going to come back and drywall the ceiling later. Um, but a feature stair, especially sometimes I've done projects where they've realized that they hadn't really kind of thought through uh, the process and they ended up having to um, sprinkler the underside of kind of a switchback on a stair um, and they wanted to hide the pipes and so they put drywall on. So all of a sudden it was a really good thing that that was designed with an L over 360 deflection criteria. Um, pay attention to what those limits are. Uh, only because you could imagine being on a really long run stair. There's landings usually built into those, again coming from part three. But take a look or at least have a conversation with the engineer about what those absolute limits are. Um, if you have a really long stair that has an absolute limit of, you know, 50 millimeters, this, that's not going to happen. Uh, but you, you could imagine you wouldn't want to be on a stair that you feel deflect 50 millimeters because you're kind of, you have a reference often to the rest of the building, especially on a feature stair. You'd have a reference to other things. The building as a whole, um, if you're getting that kind of loading criteria, you lose sense of what's kind of happening around you and you, you wouldn't even notice that the deflection is happening. It's a little more apparent sometimes around your sta on a stair and that's where perception and people's comfort comes into play. You're gonna find that that's not really what, that's probably not gonna be a thing you need to worry about, but it might be worth having the conversation. So vibration is the one that's much more complex. I don't expect you to do these calculations. Ooh, did you put pumpkin spice in this for me? I did. Nice, it's my man. Um, so these are, oh, are you joining us? Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, okay. I'm gonna share some philosophy on vibration okay. and, and right. how they arrive at the mm. criteria. Okay, uh, did, you wanna, did you wanna just talk about this then? No, I don't know the, uh, the slide. Why don't you talk about the slide and I'll talk about the background. Well, it's really just, I've pulled the equations from the co closest guideline we have. So they don't really address it explicitly in our steel code, um, but as what happens with anything, um, if we don't have it in our code, if there's another reasonable code that exists, we're still expected to try to find that and utilize that. Um, one of the American standards, um, the AISC Steel Design Guide, goes into great depth about vibration. 
uh, and they talk about it for kind of um, bridges, uh, um, uh, floors, um, that usually doesn't tend to govern, but bridges is a big one. And then they talk about basic stairs, but really their big one is monumental stairs. Um, monumental stairs kind of really just means grand stairs, like your feature stairs, your, your element stairs, the thing that's really kind of showing off in the building. Often because you're trying to really make, if it's a feature element, you're often trying to remove a lot of the material, uh, kind of leaving either something light and airy or to leave room for the heavy material you're putting on it. Um, and so these stairs really need something to talk about vibration. So what I've pulled up here are straight out of the code, the equations. They're quite complex. They have a component where you have to figure out the frequency of the stair. Now, a lot of engineers in today's era model things for strength and stiffness. And once you've done that, you can often pull out the natural frequency of your stair. And it'll give you your modes of frequency as well. So uh, how it moves laterally or how, what its frequency is laterally might be different from what it is up and down. Um, <clears throat> and then once you have your natural frequency, it gives you different criteria depending on that. You have to look at what your angle of your stair is, how long your stair is, what the weight of your stair is because the mass has an impact on it. And then they look at three separate things. They look at um, you as a person walking up the stair and how you feel it. You as a person standing on the stair and someone else walking up the stair and how that makes you feel. So there's your movement impacting you. There's someone else's movement impacting you. And then there's that same criteria a second time, but that person is running up the stairs. So they're going with kind of much more of a, or a, 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 a quicker period. So they're running up it faster and how that would impact you. And they do say in the code that um, you might not need to do both of those. You might not need to do the person running as well or in this guide. Um, if it's a stair that is um, uh, kind of, think about the use of the stair. Um, so if it's in um, a big place, a library or a, a museum, you can imagine you would get somebody running beside people walking. So it becomes a big kind of criteria. Someone's house, if somebody runs up the stairs while other people are walking on it, first off, you might not have room. Uh, and so that might be an unrealistic um, criteria to put on the design of your stair. So there is some leeway there. And again, this is a guide. It's not a, a code. So it is about reasonable use and your applications. Um, there are a few other things I wanted to mention about this. Um, did, one of the quick checks we'll put on a stair for vibration um, is we'll say, okay, before we even go into that, let's just see if we're in the realm of, because it's a lot of work to calculate the, the natural frequency and then what the, uh, what the actual kind of vibration limits are. Um, you know, it can be days and days of work. Um, even setting up a spreadsheet, you know, it's different for each stair. So you kind of have to really dig into it and kind of take bits out of it. Um, so one of the quick checks, and where did you, I don't know where this came from, the one millimeter for one kilonewton. It's in the ASC design guide, and, and it is it is applicable for stairs with natural frequencies above, I think, 11 hertz, something like right. that. So it is in a published design guide. But it's, um, it might not be the only limit. So what I often do is I start with this limit, is I'll put one kilonewton, in the worst places on the stair separately um, and see how much the stair moves. And if it moves less than one millimeter, I know I'm in a good place that now I can start doing my in-depth vibration criteria if I need to. Um, the owner might say, I don't care. If somebody feels a little unsettled going up that stair, I don't care, it's my feature stair. I don't wanna spend the money to make it kind of have this vibration limit if you've met kind of the basics. I've even had a stair where I've said, all right, here's here's what our kind of due diligence limit is. We start with one kilonewton, we look how much it moves, and we've had owners that said, I don't even care about that. I'll accept two, three millimeters of movement. So where it's all about perception and it's all about intended use, having that understanding and making it explicit to your client becomes really important. 
So I was I was going to provide some background because I'm on a number of code committees and and uh, and there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of work being done on um, uh, on vibration um, specifically, and it's interesting because you look at these formulas like in this slide and and this is a long detailed formula with multiple uh, degree or multiple um, multiple decimal place accuracy you tend to consider them with a great deal of, uh, of reverence. reverence yeah. um, but what, what happens is, is they'll go out and they'll measure a whole lot of different stairs, for example, stairs and bridges. And, um, and then they'll start assessing, um, they'll measure the properties, the beha structural behavior, and then they'll ask people, is this acceptable? Is it not acceptable? Yeah. Um, and you wind up with a gigantic scatter of data um, and the same stare, somebody will find it acceptable and some, somebody will find it unacceptable. And then they start plotting acceptable and not acceptable relative to a big range of criteria. So you might have on, on one axis the static deflection and on another axis the natural frequency and you'll get a whole scatter of data in here. And some of these up in that zone will be acceptable and some of these down in that zone will be unacceptable. And they'll do a regression analysis and derive a line through the scatter. And, um, and from that line will come a formula. And it'll, it'll look highly precise, like the formula must mean something very specific. But it's not. It's just a line through a big scatter of data um, of very highly subjective um, uh, very highly subjective response to the behavior of the structure. Um, so as complicated as this is, it is not to be revered, you know. Um, and in fact, from, from our personal experience, um, the, uh, um, you can have something that satisfies the most stringent criteria. If you have a client that's nitpicky, they are going to, to sue you anyway because they're not happy. So... Um, so the but that's where having done the most stringent published data anyone would have your back and be like you can sue them you're not gonna win that's right but uh, if you haven't done it they might be able to make a case even though another client might be totally okay with it so so as shannon said what we're trying to do is establish that we've met our duty of care our mood, duty of care as designers is to do what a reasonable practitioner would do in a similar circumstance. So we follow the published methodology, and generally they say that that you know if you if you meet the stringent criteria, ninety five percent of people will be happy with this stare. If you meet the the kind of minimum acceptable criteria, fifty percent of people will be happy, or some you know something like that. So, um, so it's a it's not ironclad. You, you know, meeting these criteria are not a guarantee that everybody's going to be happy. Um, they are about establishing a duty of care to make sure most people are happy. What, um, what trust manufacturer in the late 90s, early 2000s, going back to some of those early projects? Hembro. <laughs> we're, <just, laughs> we're just throwing out names. Yeah. Um, they actually had for their serviceability criteria, they didn't have any numbers to it. They called it, you know, they had names for their trusses. And then when you looked at their vibration criteria um, table in the back, it was a series of faces that went from sad to mediocre to kind of happy to super happy. And that was kind of showing that scatter of data of the percentage of people that would be comfortable on that stair. Which is actually appropriately represented, I thought right? it was fantastic. Not like these complicated formulas yeah. that make it sound like you're, you're right or wrong. It's not, yeah, it's not. Exactly. So what they've determined when they, do, when they do all this analysis is that there's a number of things that affect people, um, people's perception. One is acceleration. So, so vibration is a wave, right? And the, the slope of the velocity wave is the acceleration or the curvature of the displacement wave is the acceleration and the acceleration is what you feel in your feet just like acceleration due to gravity is what pushes you to the earth um, the when the floor vibrates you're feeling acceleration in your feet you're feeling your weight increasing and decreasing as the floor goes up and down because your acceleration is changing if you guys remember we did those calculations 
when we did loads and I said, it doesn't really mean much to you, but it's a good idea to have a, a handle on because it kind of impacts some other things. This is one of those things. So when you look at these criteria, you say the middle, middle range criteria, acceleration tolerance limit, 3% of gravity, that means 3% of your weight. That means that the earth is pushing up on my feet with six pounds extra force and that is cycling fast. Um, so 3% of gravity doesn't sound like a big number, but six pounds pressing on your feet is actually significant. You can imagine that would feel like something. It's like you carrying a six pound weight and then somebody trying to lift you up with a six pound weight mm -hmm. or pulling against you with a six pound weight. And that in a cyclical manner really is noticeable. So that's, that's the, probably the primary criteria. Second criteria is the frequency. They find that, that that humans are really susceptible to um, vibration in around the natural frequency of our body, which is around two and a half hertz. Um, and, uh, and so we're very sensitive to that. Higher frequencies above 10, 11 hertz, that, that's a 10 or 11 cycles per second, we are much less sensitive to it. So the acceleration, the, the tightest acceleration limit happens at two and a half hertz, and then it gets looser at... Um, uh, at higher frequencies. Um, they find it really matters if you're a participant in creating the vibration. So Shannon was talking about the small stair versus big stair. If it's a small stair and you're the one running up it, um, or, or you're, you know, you're connected to the person in some way who's running up it, you're involved in the activity, then, then uh, vibration due to them running up and down it is not going to bother you the same way as if you're in the gallery of the Guggenheim, for example, and you're looking at a painting and someone runs by behind you um, and you feel that. Um, so, so whether or not you're a participant um, is, is significant. Um, another one is damping. So damping is the rate of decay of the vibration. Um, and uh, uh, if the vibration decays very quickly, so you can imagine that a damping of 100% means that you feel the first impulse and then no more. So, so somebody takes a step behind you, you feel it and then it's gone. That's not going to bother you nearly as much as very low damping where someone runs behind you and you feel the stair fluttering as um, for some period of time afterwards. So all these formulas are, are empirically de derived. Those are the basic inputs in these formulas and, and we just want to remember, you know, frequency and acceleration and damping are really the, the kind of big three and... Uh, Which are all things, if you go back to the slides from structures one um, in our strength, stiffness and stability, which I've kind of driven home to you guys, you guys would have done at the beginning of structures one and the beginning of structures two, that those slides are in there and that's kind of really where those are coming from. We didn't spend a lot of time on it because it doesn't really impact the building as a whole. I mean, it does sometimes, but it's really rare. And these are the, we're here to talk about those rarer things now. So it's kind of more of an important thing for you guys to consider. Now, I mean, having said that, um, you know, as I, as I start by trying to, to kind of um, diminish the, the vibration criteria, the chances of a structural failure exceedingly low, um, where the structures are very safe, they have big safe, safety factors. The chances of somebody being um, upset by too much vibration, very high. So as much as, as, uh, uh, as, much as it's, it's a line through a scatter of data and, and you shouldn't revere the formula so much, it is really important to be really sensitive to it because this is where the structures will, will, um, will kind of pass or fail from people's, from an, people's performance perception. expectation. Yeah, perception, perception of it. And so this is where I came back to talking about um, like drywall cracking is probably one of the number one places we get sued in cr and concrete cracking. Probably second is people's perception of vibration. And if we follow these, it kind of just disappears. No, they might want to sue us, but they, they can't really. And it just came to me a third one. Uh, it it will, will come to it. Um, but these ones that are kind of slightly more frivolous where it's... Um, um, they might feel it's true, um, but uh, a kind of a, a collection of our peers doing the same good work wouldn't. Um, and if we can meet that criteria, we'll be okay as a, as a team together.
Okay, thank you for letting me have my rant. <laughs> he talks about this a little. Um, so he'll come back in um, at various points, and he might just wander in if he has a story or a thought. Um, it's really unnerving. I'm backwards, and so when I put hair behind my ear, I'm looking at the wrong side. Um, so let's uh, let's look at a free body diagram of a stair. Um, we're going to have load. This is a very simple stair, very simple load. This is um, kind of a stringer along here. We're going to talk about the parts of a stair as well. And we're just wanted to kind of get in the habit of always drawing a free body diagram every time we talk about something. Uh, I did have some, one student send me in a free body diagram. It was a fantastic free body diagram um, of a lamp post. Um, and they, they did look at the loading. I liked uh, whoever you were. I did like that the loading increased as, the, as it went up the height of the lamppost. Um, and also that uh, you had the moment connection drawn at the base, that it wasn't resolved with a couple, that it was actually resolved with a moment reaction at the base. So good job on that. Um, but we're gonna get in the habit of always drawing ourselves a free body diagram. Um, one of the things I don't talk about in these slides is kind of your first phase of your project. So I'll make a second little mini um, video that talks about what we're expecting from that. It's not a lot of hard work. It's about 10% of your mark and it's, it's um, kind of just getting ourselves ready to kind of go through the project. So what are some of the common stair assemblies? There's always going to be something kooky you can do out of anything. Um, I'm gonna start with some of the more common ones um, and then we'll move on to kind of some of the fancy stuff. So, uh, cast in place concrete are probably most, one of the two most utilitarian ones. If you're doing a concrete building, they might opt for precast stairs. It's a little bit harder depending on the size because you have to kind of fish them in. Um, great for outdoor work sometimes, um, assuming you kind of have them protected appropriately. Um, but uh, concrete or cast in place and precast stairs a lot happen a lot in concrete buildings. Um, more common in steel buildings would be steel stairs. Now, steel stair can be made up of a few different components. Um, often we're talking about the treads and or risers as well as the stringers being steel, but we might mix around those materials a little bit. Um, probably the most common stairs are the ones you see in most houses that are wood stairs. Um, and those are probably the most basic, but we don't see kind of the nuts and bolts of them all that often because we often hide it up. Um, and in a wood stair, often it's just all wood, it probably the stringer, the tread, and the riser. And I'll, I'll show you what all of those things are. Um, and then we have fancy stairs that kind of mix everything up together. So just to kind of give you an, for people that maybe the, the, the language of talking about stairs might not be normal to you. I would imagine most of you know what we're talking about, but just to be thorough, I want to give you a slide that kind of breaks that down. So our tread is the thing that we actually put our foot on. So when we go up a set of stairs, we're standing on the treads. The back of the stair is the riser. Um, we don't always have a riser on every stair. There might not be anything there. Um, it acts as a kick plate um, so we don't lose things down it, so things can't go down there. If there's um, a fire rating, um, that might be the surface that we use for our fire rating. Um, but they, some codes allow no risers depending on the application or the location of the building. So we would still often talk about the rise though because when we need to communicate how kind of the length, the length of our stair, we still talk about it as our tread and our riser, even if we might not have any material in there. We'll talk about the rise of each step. The stringer is the heavy lifter here. So also the treads are usually spanning between our two stringers. Um, our stringer is uh, essentially the beam of our stairs. Normally we have two, not always. Sometimes we might have one, sometimes we might have three. Three isn't as effective as you might think because the middle one is taking the same amount of load as if we just had two on the edges. So if you look at tributary width there, you see that that middle one is still doing a lot of work. 
or depending on kind of what your soffit of your stair looks like. Um, if you had a concrete stair, basically every little width of the concrete stair is technically a stringer. Or this, the concrete as itself is one big beam kind of going up the distance. So I can see my kids through the window. They're looking at me. The landing. Not every stair has a landing, and these landings can happen mid part of a stair. Sometimes it's about facilitating making a turn on a stair. If you have a long stair, it can be about giving people a resting place. The, those are usually prescribed in great detail um, in part three, and they, the amount of landing you need, um, and if you need a landing, is often dependent on how long your run of stair is, and even how steep your stair is for each amount of run. Um, uh, so, you know, depending, like it's not necessarily always if your stair is going this distance, you need this amount of landing or you need a landing. It can have, um, it can be tied into also how steep it is. Um, but those different differ from code to code. So you really need to take a look at uh, part three for that. Guards. Guards are the thing that are at the edge of a stair uh, if you don't have a wall there, but if you have a wall there, it's technically acting as your guard that stops someone from falling off the edge of your stair. Um, we're going to do a whole module. The next module we're going to do is going to be on guards. I mostly wanted to show you the guards, but sometimes what we can have is guards that are slightly more tied into our stringer. Sometimes our guard and our stringer can be one piece, and so we have one deep stringer doing the work for us. And so that's, that's kind of really the only spot we're going to talk about the guards today. You need to know they exist. Um, guards and handrails aren't necessarily the same thing, and they have different loading criteria. Loading for guards comes from part four. Loading for handrails comes from part three. Um, again, we'll talk about that next week as well. Uh, so handrail would maybe be the guard and the handrail might be the same thing. Sometimes you might have a separate piece of material above, if this is your guard, you might have a handrail here. Um, so they might be the same piece. Sometimes they might be a completely separate thing right in front of it. Um, pickets. Pickets are usually the things that go in between our guard posts. We normally think of them as going straight up and down. Um, here I, I have happened to show them running this way. The criteria for pickets, again, we're going to talk about next week, um, but think essentially four inches. You don't want they say a ball, but really what they're thinking is, is a child's head. We wouldn't have to worry about my eldest because he is the head of the size of a melon. Um, but we're trying to stop a baby's head from uh, kind of getting caught in those guards or prevent a baby from trying to climb through a guard. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about wood stairs. These are residential wood stairs, the ones that you'd see in a house. They're pretty basic. They're probably not even part of part four. Typically they'd be in part nine, which is the, we've built it so many times, we know it's A-OK -okay part of the code. That's kind of the way I think of part nine. Um, often an engineer doesn't need to get involved and a contractor or an architect or an owner can go to part nine on their own and see the rules for how to build something. And for most homes, stairs would be covered in part nine. You can see we've got our stringers, We've got our treads here. They're probably gonna put a riser in here, but they'll wait until they get ready to kind of put their carpet up against it. Uh, we've got a landing. This stair starts here, goes up. The landing's connected to the wall. So essentially what we've got is two stairs. We've got this stair that goes from ground to halfway up, and then we've got another stair that goes from this wall here and goes up to this landing. Um, so we can have conditions where that's not the case, probably not in wood, but we'll talk about some of those conditions. I wanted to show you some images of basic things. Um, these are 100% from the internet. Uh, so I just wanted to show you kind of some typical steel stairs. You can see that we've got some, uh, we've got some means where the landings are supported. So we've got some steel posts here. We've got our stringer, treads, guards, pickets. 
Um, these ones here, we've got channels. I, I have some slides where I talk about um, some of those as well. Here, so steel stairs. Let's talk about the treads, what the treads look like in a steel stair. And I'll talk about the stringers in a minute too. Uh, probably the most common would be um, either a bent plate or a channel that we fill with concrete. Um, so you can see here, this is a piece of steel. Um, this is a channel that then somebody comes in and fills with concrete. So you have a stair there that's basically a pan and formwork for the concrete. Uh, we could have wood treads in a steel stair. Maybe we have a ledger. Um, not as common, um, but we could do it. A steel grating, really common in kind of industrial applications where you, you have suppliers that provide different types of grating. And so that's kind of your, your tight mesh of steel. Um, and there's different types. There's expanded where they literally kind of slice up a plate and stretch it out. Um, or they have ones where they have bars that they weld onto plates. Um, or they have ones with two bars or ones with two plates. Um, they often even have stair treads prefabricated. So you can go onto their kind of their shopping list of steel treads and go pick out what works for your application. Um, we could do just steel plate, so without the concrete. So here's one here where we've got a, a bent piece of steel. Um, you can see this one was nice because it gave them a place to kind of hook in their riser. And I'll show you an example of one of these as a feature stair that I did. Um, you could have steel with some other type of cladding. Maybe you have steel with um, concrete stone or stone on it or precast. Um, maybe you've got wood finishes. Maybe you've got carpet on it. Um, I doubt you'd go to the trouble of making a steel stair and put carpet on it. You'd probably be talking about a wood stair in that context. But these are all options of what you can do. You could also have extruded aluminum. Um, so extruded aluminum is kind of where they push the aluminum through a die or pull it through a die and you come out with a shape. So you can see here, you know, this is kind of one beam spanning in this direction that they've essentially got a series of five little beams working together, but kind of melded together as one big thing. The risers usually will match what the, uh, uh, probably shouldn't, this was one I needed to update, you probably wouldn't have concrete and metal pan as your riser, so scratch that. Uh, but most of the other things would be true, and whatever you're doing for your tread, you're probably doing for your riser, unless you have no riser. Um, so a steel pan probably a has a steel riser. Um, let's go on, let's take a look at steel stringers. Um, there is so much variety in what we can do for steel stringers. Kind of your basic utilitarian steel stair, you're going to do channels as the side. Um, so you can see here, this is a channel. If you guys remember, these are what our channel looks, channels look like. The most common ones you've probably seen, uh, I think even the stairs in the exits at Daniel's, are a steel pan or channel between or a, yeah, steel pan or a channel kind of turned up, running between two steel channels as the stringers that kind of go from floor to landing, floor to landing. Um, we can do steel HSSs. Um, we can do one stringer down the middle. So you can see here there's an option of that there. We can do one off to the side where we cantilever out the treads. Um, this could be exposed or this could be hidden if we built the wall right here. We could kind of have that hiding um, behind the wall so it just looks like these stair treads can't leave her out. Um, we could do plate steel for the side and that actually happens quite often when we're doing the guard as a piece of plate steel as well. We might need to add some bits to it to give it a little, to stop it from oil canning or that local buckling that we didn't spend any time talking about in structures one and structures two because it didn't really govern most of our things. We just said make it class one or class two. And we don't have to worry about local buckling. When we have thin pieces of steel that are large but thin, that's when we start worrying about local buckling. And that so a steel plate would be a place where we'd start to worry about local buckling governing. So we'd have to do some work to check on that. Um, 
we can have a built up section where we make a section, we make it up. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a few minutes. Like I said, we could have it be part of the guard. And like I said, also the, the hidden, uh, the hidden stringer with the cantilevered tread. So I had made this slide and I went back and found an old lecture Dave had done like, I don't know, I want to say 30 years ago, but it was probably more like 15, <laughs> um, uh, where I had written this list and he had drawn, so I, I wrote this list and then I went and I found that he had drawn all these in a slideshow that he had done. So I just kind of stole them all and dropped them into this, but um, really we kind of both got to the same place. Um, the landing, again, the landing probably follows what we've done for the tread for a steel one. Um, this is an example here where we did, um, pan filled with concrete. So essentially we did a pan landing as well, but what's the easiest cheap pan we can find? Well, it already exists. It's metal deck. Um, so for the landing, I just used metal deck. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what's normal for this because it's kind of just normal for what happens for the treads as well. Uh, concrete cast in place. Um, you would find these kind of in, in large scale applications. Um, kind of some of the, the, the big pathway stairs would often be in concrete. Um, we have a few things that we need to maintain here and that's the effective thickness. And so that's where our rebar is doing all the work. We need to keep our rebar in the zone that is our effective thickness or what we're using to do our analysis. And usually that's a straight run. And so for a stair where we want a smooth soffit, this would be our uh, effective thickness right there or that distance kind of on the diagonal. And all of our rebar that's doing our structural work would go in that zone right there. Uh, if we wanted to keep our rebar as a flat, straight run, and we wanted though that image of the stair kind of following the profile top and bottom, this would be our effective thickness. And we'd be able to do a really easy kind of reinforcing of that stair. If we wanted to get really fancy and really get that stair to be as thin as we possibly could, we could have an effective thickness but now our rebar becomes much more complicated. We're trying to bend our rebar to do the work to follow this profile. So this would be a really kind of complex um, engineering exercise, but also fabrication exercise. Um, the shop drawings for this would probably go across your desk about 20 times, I can guarantee it. Um, you can see here that this is one where they followed uh, the first profile where they have kind of an exposed soffit and they'd actually did a board form uh, soffit here on this one which really kind of turned out beautiful. Um, Dave wants to look at it. I can, he's, he's <laughs> I can see him going perking up. What? <laughs> board form concrete? Um, this concrete stair was st so large that instead of just acting as one beam going up, they actually have followed the same methodology of a steel stair where we have two large beams doing the majority of the work and then a one-way slab spanning in between the, the steel or the concrete stringers. Uh, what does the rebar look like in a concrete stair? Well, this is where I said, we kind of want to try to keep it as that flat run. This is what's going to make it easy. Again, this is still a lot of rebar. You can see that it's doweled into the walls that are adjacent to it. Um, and um, uh, we have top steel, bottom steel, where we transition to the landing. We have to hook our ends because we need to keep it closed. Um, and then the stairs are, we, there might be a little bit of rebar in there for the nosing, but it's more just about keeping our fin the finish nice and limiting cracking as our concrete cures. But the heavy lifting rebar is in a flat sheet um, that's about this thick in our effective thickness of our concrete. Here are some precast stairs. You can see that they kind of just churn them out at a plant. 
um, you might build your building um, to meet the precast stair options that exist. Or you might step it up a notch and get a custom precast stair. But usually, if you're doing that, what makes it cost effective is if you're doing a lot of them. Um, so if you have the same staircase 50 times in your project, having a precast stair custom made might be worth it because you're setting off that engineering and then setting up their plant to churn out enough of them so you've amortized that cost over multiple sets of stairs. Um, you can see that maybe they have kind of a steel ledger on them. Maybe they're sitting on precast, a, diff a whole system of precast. Um, there's all kinds of different stair types. I'm gonna go through some of the ones that are more common. While I was doing it, one of the sites that kept coming up again and again and again that I kept wanting to steal their pictures, but I didn't, um, was this site here. So feel free to go take a look. They just have all kinds of different stair types. You can find all kinds of unique things. Um, the drawings are pretty basic, so it's not, it's not fancy stairs. It's literally just a drawing illustrating what the name of that stair is, which I'm gonna go through most of them right now. So a straight run stair is probably your most common stair, and that's where your stringer goes from ground to your next level. Um, you don't have anything happening within it. You could have a straight run stair where maybe you've added in a landing as well. I'd still probably call that a straight run stair, even though there's a landing in it. They prop, some places might refer to it as a straight run stair with a landing, um, but your stringer is going from point A to point B without much happening in between. Um, maybe it takes a jog, but it's still in a straight plane. The free body diagram of it essentially doesn't change. Probably what you've seen the most in a house. Um, again, often hidden by things, but this might be the stair that turns into this. Exit stairs. Again, this could really be any type of stair. They could be inside, they could be outside. Um, but these are usually um, exposed, um, have some sort of fire rating, or the fire rating might be how they're encapsulated and separated from the rest of the building, or again, stuck outside of the building. I more just wanted to reference that that exists. It's probably not really the focus of what we're talking about, but calling it an exit stair puts some particular criteria on it. Um, what a lot of architects will do is meet all of the stair exit requirements in their exit stairs so that their feature stair doesn't have to meet that criteria. Sometimes though, if you don't have enough space and you need, I don't know, five exit stairs for your building and you've only got four in your cores, your feature stair might also have to meet the requirements of an exit stair. And that's where kind of allowances on what the fire ratings are can be really important. So sometimes you can have what are considered major means of egress but still have one set of stair that maybe doesn't have to meet the same um, fire rating. Uh, scissor stairs are where you have two vertical stairs on one footprint. So two means of egress, but happening in one footprint. And they would often pass each other. So you can see here in one core, we've met the requirement of two stairs. One starts over here and one starts over here. So it's not just two stairs side by two stairs side by side. You actually enter them you actually enter them from two different spots. Switchback stairs. So a switchback stair is where you come down, hit a landing and turn around and keep coming down. We have two major ways we would design that. Most of the time we support it. Whether we put columns down to the ground below or we connect it to the wall that we're beside at the landing, because often these landings kind of butt up against a wall. Um, maybe it's because it, often we do it when we don't have a lot of footprint for our stair, or we have a more square shape for our footprint. We can't do one, we can't do one long run of stair. Um, here are just some, some diagrams Dave had done um, way back when of a can, Dave's like, I did, um, of a switchback that's cantilevered. Um, so here is a, a concrete one. Don't worry about these too much, but you can see at the base, this was moment connected and there was a reaction um, at the top and the bottom of the stair. The steel one, we actually take that moment out as a couple because we have two stringers coming down. 
Um, often where the load is focused um, can change. You can see that he's drawn these reactions as much higher at the inner stringer versus the outer stringer. Um, often this is true, but remember, if you guys remember way back to structures one and structures two, more structures two, I think, I said that load follows the path of resistance. It's not the path of least resistance, it will follow the path of resistance. So as you, if you have two stringers that are the exact same stiffness, this diagram would be true. As you start to change the inner stiffness and outer, st stiffness, outer, outer stringer relative stiffness, this diagram can start to change. So you could ultimately start to redistribute that load to where you want it, but you might have to play with it a lot. So, um, but it is worth noting that your reactions aren't your reactions. As you change your stringers, it can actually change where the load goes as you change your member sizes. So here are some images of some uh, cantilevered switchbacks where they're unsupported here. Um, and how we connect these at the landing can vary. Um, Dave had drawn that image um, years ago of the one I just showed you where they moment connected the stringers to the elements within the landing. And what you moment connect can what can vary depending on what materials you're using, what access there is, are they building it all in the shop and bringing it in? Are they going to install it in pieces? Um, all of that can play in. So there's not one right answer. This is what we moment connect to what and this is what these stringers look like. It really depends on the application. Uh, spiral stairs. Spiral stairs are the ones where we have one central post um, and then a stringer that curves around it. Um, so you can see we have a central post here and we have a central post here and this stringer that curves around it. This one's really interesting where it's um, chunks of mass timber and as they sit on each other, you could imagine that if you wanted, you could drill a hole down through that and have a post. My guess is they actually did do that. Um, but conceptually, the free body diagram of this, you could, you could build it this way. My guess is the installation would probably be quite difficult and it would, and you'd have to deal with uplift from the top stair. The bottom one's not so much. If you stand out on the edge of this stringer, you've got the weight of all of these stairs here, but on the upper ones, what's kind of holding that down. So they probably did kind of thread something down through and cap it off to make sure that doesn't happen, but you could do it without an internal post there. A circular stair, very similar to a spiral stair, um, takes up a very small footprint relative to the kind of rise over run applications you're trying to go for. Um, but this is where both the in, inner and outer portion of the stair occurred. So um, we don't have that tight single spot in the middle. Um, I, I, I was tempted to say it means we have two curved stringers, but the same way we had with um, stairs with one stringer, uh, you could do one middle stringer as well. Um, but this is often what we do where we have kind of two radii, not one circle with a center, but two circles kind of set in each other. Cantilevered treads, a lot of the work is happening in the background. So what you see is just these treads coming out, but quite often there'd either be a stringer embedded in the wall. You can see this one here shows the stringer embedded in the wall here, and you can see that they've had to notch these and they've probably had to do something kind of um, innovative with how they've built this wall because we can't just cut away our studs. Um, or maybe we have something cast or anchored um, right into the concrete. So this one, what they might have done is cast plates in that have rods and then these pieces um, are doweled for it and come on and slip those on. Where that would be a, difficult to start to resolve would maybe be up here where you have to worry about your floor above. Um, I, and also, where's your guard? You have to have a building department that would allow you to have this without a guard, or you have to come up with um, ideas on how to do that. I have a project that I was just working on where the client um, got a little bit antsy about that exact condition because they have um, three boys. 
um, and they 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 were worried about this cantilever tread and the guard, and they just said, you know what, um, I appreciate everything you're saying. Me and the architect talked them through what the vibration means, um, and they said that they were the sort of person where they wouldn't be comfortable with um, kind of loosening up any of the vibration criteria. If anything, they would have wanted the tightest, most stringent vibration criteria. Um, so they ended up changing their mind on, on what kind of stair they're going to do. It's still going to be a cool stair. I can't really tell about it yet because I don't know if I have any um, freedom to share that one with you yet. Uh, this one's kind of cool where it's um, uh, got a series of pieces of wood with um, a plate on it tying them together. Um, <laughs> did you want to say something about it, or did you just want to? No, no. I just realized it? you're talking about all the cool stuff now. And I, I want <laughs> no, to be part of it. You're gonna come back. I'm just talking. I'm just giving a, t a teaser of yeah. the cool stuff. You're gonna come back because at 4:30 in half an hour, you guys don't know what time it is. Uh, in half an hour, our uh, our uh, our child care help, who's only here for a few hours, three days a week, is gonna leave, and I'm gonna have to go look after the kids, and you're gonna get to carry on uh, doing this lecture. Um, haha. aren't you glad you stayed yeah, yeah, for just for this sure. time? Um, this, we've, we, we so want to do La Pierre Stair. La Pierre? La Pierre? La Pierre. La, La Pierre. Yeah, is with a, but it, La Pierre, um, or alternating tread stair, if you're going to get, um, uh, kind of really kind of set on what you call it. What this is, is that you lead with the same foot going down or up. Um, but where you step is set. Um, some people will go up a stair uh, different ways and you have your choice of where you step on your tread. Um, the advantage is, is that it takes up a much smaller footprint without having to employ a circular stair or uh, a switchback. Um, so we get that much smaller footprint um, by basically forcing people to only go in the same spot. You could probably even shorten up your treads a little bit if you wanted, but often there are code requirements on how big your tread needs to be. Um, it can become really cool because you can start to build storage into things. Um, it works really well like to get up into attics of old buildings. Um, our old house, which was a piece of crap, um, and we uh, used our attic for storage and we had nothing but a little attic hatch um, and we were going to build um, a La Paris stair in that, but then we finally had kids and needed a bigger house than our little tiny piece of crap. Um, here's one that's really cool where they, they still have the alternating treads, uh, they have a guard built into it, um, but they've managed to build that into storage as well. So you can do all kinds of really cool things with La Paire stairs. Not by code, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reasonably certain that a, that a La Paire stair, um, can't be justified under the building code because the building code does provide, provide prescriptive limits on, on rise and run. Um, we are dealing with one architect who is making an argument that it is a convenient stair, it's not a required stair because each of the, each of the spaces that are accessed by the stair have another means of egress. So every room is connected directly to the outdoors, um, therefore the, the stair is a matter of convenience only and, the, and they're trying to argue that it's like climbing up a set of drawers or something you know it's not a uh, it's not a required stair therefore it doesn't need to conform to the building code and I would imagine for um, um, rooms like attics which have, attic. which have you use a ladder that's the that's, that's the it. normal means of accessing an attic having a pair of stair to get into an attic which is what we were trying to do um, it would be okay yeah um, it's space that's or, considered Inaccessible. Inaccessible. Um, or it to, doesn't have you know, an occupancy. Yeah, exactly. With it. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure there's probably a prescription somewhere in Part 9 that if you're doing a Part 9 building that maybe you could get away with it. I, yeah. I'm not sure about that, um, but there's probably somewhere that you could find a loophole to kind of get away probably with it. Probably anywhere that, that is permitted to be accessed by ladder. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to show you four uh, projects that I've done. Um, have any of them while I was with Blackwell? No, these ones were all on, your own, all right? on my own, um, doing my company. Um, some, uh, one of, two of them were Blackwell projects that I did the stair for. Actually, no, three of them were Blackwell projects. Um, 
Uh, one of them, Blackwell, commissioned me to do the stairs. Um, two of them, the architect commissioned me to do the stair separate from Blackwell's contract. Um, and then w one of them was just completely independent from Blackwell altogether. So there are three very different stairs. Um, I'm going to show you what the drawings look like. Um, I'm going to kind of talk through uh, what loading conditions I use. I'm going to talk about those, those three major things I talked about. I'm going to talk about the load for strength. I'm going to talk about um, serviceability and vibration. Um, and I'm going to show you the free body diagram of it. Um, but then I'm also just going to tell you some anecdotal stories about uh, what problems we faced, what challenges there were on the project. So the first one is the Senate building that opened up two years ago, a year ago, um, that da Diamond and Schmidt did with in partnership with KWC in Ottawa. Um, the base building engineer is based out of Ottawa and they were um, primarily a heritage um, and restoration architect. Um, so this, this feature stair wasn't the sort of thing that uh, kind of was within their wheelhouse. Um, uh, DSA uh, kind of kept me on retainer for all of the feature elements in the Senate building. So the feature stair, all of the guards, um, kind of the main entry door needed its own framework. They had kind of major signage, which were big planks of massive stone um, at the doorways, but Ottawa is a high seismic zone, uh, including the stair. We had to worry about seismic uh, considerations as well, because Ottawa is a really, really high seismic zone. Um, so all of those things were their feature elements that, that I looked after the engineering for. Um, it's really hard when you hear your kid cry and you can't go see them. Um, uh, so this stair was interesting, or many of the objects in this building were interesting because often they kept the handrail separate from the guard. Um, this condition wasn't. They, they actually uh, applied the handrail to the guard. Um, but in some of them, in some of the conditions, what they wanted was to, they were going to be hiding this inner stringer so much that we were able to bring our stringer up into the guard zone a little bit. Um, so this is the main stairs that um, senators would walk up or down to get from the main landing down into the Senate chamber right outside the door. So it comes down right outside the main door um, where they go into the Senate building. So this is what my structural drawings look like. I'll show you a sequence of drawings. Um, so you can see that it's an unsupported switchback cantilever. So it cantilevers out. We don't have any support over here. Um, this stringer or this beam here was in the main floor, the second floor, and it was existing to me. It had been designed and installed by the base building engineer team with the contractor by the time I was um, engaged to do the stair. They had left a stair allowance, so they knew a stringer of some sort was going here, but they didn't know the finishes, they didn't know the weights, they had left some amount of an allowance for a stair. Uh, so I had to be kind of very uh, aware of the fact that I was tying into something someone else, is, someone else designed, and I needed to be able to provide reactions. You can see that I gave very detailed breakout of forces so that their base building engineer could just look and compare that to what allowances they had put in their preliminary design. So or their their design of the, the, the beam and say yes this is below those loads that we had put on it. Um, we had a built up section on the outside and a built up section on on the inside. So we ended up not, we didn't design it as a built up section on the inside. You can see the inner stringer here, HSS 305 by 76 by 13. So that means we had something that was relatively tall and narrow. So it was um, uh, 12 inches tall and three inches wide. And the thickness of that was half an inch. This section here, there was nothing that worked that fit in the criteria that they had and they had reveals that they wanted to do. They had a very particular look they wanted because they were just going to come in and clad this with a thin sheet of bronze. Um, so we needed our section to kind of um, allow uh, a reveal to happen. So it's hard to see in, in this capture here, uh, but we had a single plate with 
plates that built up essentially a section that made an HSS. Um, so uh, you don't need to worry about it too much what the shape was, but we made a built up HSS that basically had some fins on it so that we could get the extra strength we needed and stiffness, which ultimately kind of helps in some ways with our vibration because we get to use those core elements to talk about our vibration. Um, our treads, um, where do we talk about our treads here? It was a flat channel. So a channel on flat, so the bottom was the flat side of the channel where the legs stick up like this, filled with concrete. Um, and these were moment connected into the sides of the stringers. And then our landing was metal deck with concrete on top. That image I showed you of a landing with a metal deck that was gonna be filled with concrete was actually this stair right here. The bottom of the stair came down onto some a pre-designed slab. So someone else had already designed this slab. And in fact, this was because this was a renovation of an existing building. So to me, it's existing twice over. There's an existing building that's being renovated by these base building engineers that are doing that engineering work. And then I am connecting to the work that the base building, the new base building engineer is doing. And unfortunately, before um, the exact layout of the stair was known, um, the power and the duct banks, or not the power, parts of elements um, for the Senate building kind of came through these duct banks. Um, and this is exactly, you can see, here's where our stairs wanted to come down. Um, and so we had to worry about these duct banks. We couldn't put, a found, what we normally would do, would just cast a big blob of concrete right here to pick everything up, but we couldn't do that. So what we did, and we also had to make sure we didn't put any load down on this. So we needed elements that could span to localized supports. So we did piers or sono tubes at three locations with plate steel. And again, this slab was already cast. So we had to chip away. If we just put the load right here on the slab, it could have transferred some of the load to this duct bank. So we had to make sure we spanned over it and allowed um, any load that sat down on these plates to only go to these right here. Uh, I think I have another diagram of that that comes up later. One of the really interesting things was, is the, um, the well, uh, the way the stair works, there's a kick force. So we had a kick force that we had to resolve that we looked at bearing along, that I looked at the edge of this plate, kind of bearing along the side of the slab. The other thing was seismic for this stair. The, the base building engineer um, was really worried about the weight of this stair and the seismic loads, that it was gonna cause a real problem. Um, so we had to do, I had to do a study um, uh, of how that seismic load got resolved. And essentially, bearing the seismic load from this steel plate into the slab, that slab had reinforcing in it, and I did a calculation to see if the engagement of the slab edge that we're bearing against and the rebar underneath it could drag through development length and engage enough of the slab to dissipate the base of that stairs seismic load. At the upper floor, I was able to just give the load to the base building engineer and say, here's the seismic load you need to resolve at the top of the stair. But at the base where things were already done, um, um, they found that it was probably best if I kind of look after that engineering for them. Um, here's kind of a layout or a breakdown of the loads um, for this project. Uh, I the, the whole thing was being covered with um, bits of marble um, and kind of glued on to the to the system and it varied uh, around the project and this was such a precise project that I really needed to know you know how thick every little bit of it was to try to kind of keep this really refined um, live loads the treads and landing 4.8 kPa like I said anything that's gonna have a photo shoot on it you're gonna want to do 4.8 this actually fell in a building that we would do 4.8 anyway um, you can see we're going to talk about this next week. I have guards and handrail loads right here. Not something you need to worry about. Um, the After the stair was built or the steel was erected, um, they went through a lot of iterations for cost savings on 
what finishes they were going to put on it. And they kept coming back to me again and again and again and again to check it. And I kept saying, you're within the load allowance, but they wanted breakdowns of what it was. So finally I said, listen, I'm going to put on my drawings the exact thickness that I've left an allowance for. If you do anything less than that, you're fine. Um, and so finally the weekly, the weekly checks that had gone on for like 12 weeks stopped for checking the exact thickness of the stone varying for all the different little parts. So here's what my structural model looked like. This is how I work. This is what the model looks like for me, where I keep everything as a line load. But this doesn't really mean much to you if you uh, kind of don't, I kind of call it seeing the matrix, um, where I can kind of look at this and I know what's happening right away. Um, it's still not easy to see, but this starts to give you a sense of what this looks like. You can see I've got those steel plates embedded in the ground and these little kind of triangle spots are my pins that are picking up the base of my stair. This particular model, I needed a couple different models because I was worried about strength, where the guards weren't helping me at all. But serviceability, where it's not about life safety and it's all about um, how the finishes move, you're allowed to use the actual stiffness of the system. So that means if you have guards, like big sheets of plywood kind of attached to your system, you get to use them. It has to work without it for strength, but I get to use it for stiffness and vibration. Um, so sometimes we often say we don't maintain two models, but something like this might be the rare occasion where we'll maintain uh, multiple models. So you're looking at the model. You can also see that's why I have the bottom of the stairs pinned here. For strength, those weren't pinned here. We just had the three sono tubes that were doing all the work. Um, I, I say we all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about me because it's just me all by myself in my company. I don't know why I say we. I think it's just habit. Um, but uh, it's the royal we. No. Yeah. Me. Um, here's the free body diagram. So these are the reactions at the base of my stair. Remember I said that the inner stringer will start to end up taking the majority of the load. You can see that the Y reaction, the up and down reaction here, the inner stringer is 154 kilonewtons. The outer stringer is only 18.5-ish kilonewtons. Um, as I varied these stringer stiffnesses, these changed somewhat. So this would, as I went through the design multiple times, um, this probably went from 15 to 30 and back down to 18. So it's something you need to be aware of, um, but most of the work is being done here by this inner stringer. Here is a close-up of what these stringers look like. I, I, keep, I keep thinking I'm in Bluebeam and I can scroll in and look at something. Um, Dave, yep. it's in 15 minutes. I'm not going to be done talking about my stuff. Will you be able to take over the kids? Yeah. And then, actually, you know what? You guys don't care. I can stop this recording, mesh them together. If I come back at 10 o'clock with a glass of wine, you're not really going to know. So I can stop it, and we can film it later yeah. tonight if that works easier for you, because okay. 5 o'clock is meltdown time for the kids anyway. Um, so this is that, um, that stringer that I was talking about uh, where we have that glass... Perimeter. So this is the outer stringer that's not doing as much work. Um, we had a plate steel here, a piece of steel here, a piece of steel there, and a piece of steel there. All of this was being wrapped in bronze. They put a shoe anchored to it with a glass guard on it. I didn't do the engineering for the glass guards, although some of them ended up coming back into my scope when we started to do some some funky things. And they had already procured the, the glass engineer for doing those guards. Um, but then we had some unique situations where it kind of came back to me and I ended up um, doing some of the elements of the glass guards in the end. Um, uh, so you can see that for this one, they ended up keeping the handrail. It wasn't in those preliminary renderings because that's all just about kind of getting the idea going. They actually kept the handrail separate from the guard and that's a thing we'll talk about kind of going forward in a week. Um, these ones here, we had pickets on our HSS as our, or our upstands for our guards. And then they had um, plywood here, um, which is what we got to use in our uh, stiffness uh, calculations. The connection, I just showed what my stringer might look like. And then um, we left 
I said they could cope it, but this was really in the context of the base building engineer, kind of what was happening at that interface. Um, and also where construction is ha had happened, I didn't really know what, um, what, where they had pipes exactly. Um, so this detail would be detailed by the fabricator's engineer. Um, so they came to me with a detail and then I reviewed it. I gave them loads um, and then we worked together to come up with a detail that worked right there. But this is what was on the, con on the contract drawings. You can see that we had channels turned up and filled with concrete and then there you can see the outline of the stone around them. Here's that close up of what the base looked like. So here's where my stringer came down and connected here and here. So that would be welded uh, uh, right there. Um, this is what that steel plate that basically acted as a drag and also a spanning beam element because this is what we were trying to avoid, a duct bank under here. Um, and the idea is, is that we don't wanna put any compression load on this and possibly damage any of those kind of, um, those elements running through the duct bank. Um, so this element, this big piece of steel had to work spanning from here to here, picking up this stringer. Here are some of the images. Now, at about this stage right here, you can see that there's just the stringers installed. Um, I got a phone call from the site saying, this thing is insane. Um, it's making us nauseous when we walk up it. Um, the vibration is, well, they didn't even know to use the term vibration. They said it's shaking all over the place. Just like, actually they even said when they stood on the corner of it, it moved about an inch. So I went back and I, I looked at um, my calculations and I calculated that it moved with one person standing right here. It turned out that the guy they were using was Gary. They told me it was Gary standing there. So I sent them a memo with a diagram of Gary standing right there at that corner and the calculated movement for Gary should have been 0.3 millimeters. Um, they were like, no, it's moving way more than that. And I said, okay, um, I've done some due diligence. Um, steel behaves in a predictable manner. It actually is very easy to predict what steel is gonna do, assuming it is built the exact way you intend it to be built. So maybe there was miscommunication or maybe there were some differences on site. Um, so I said, hang something that weighs one kilonewton right here and measure, start with it, not there, measure that distance, hang something from it and then measure it. There's real confusion on site about how to handle that. So I drew some diagrams, they hung a few sandbags and they then said, well, we were wrong. That's not the way it's moving. It's that it's moving back and forth. It's like, oh. Okay, that's not what we thought, but all right, we'll look at that now. Um, so I looked at the implications of um, uh, lateral vibration. Um, not often what governs a stair design. Um, I went back and I went through those, those calculations. We had such kind of tight, tight criteria on this that I, we didn't do a, an original, I didn't do an original vibration check because it met all the criteria and it was such kind of a robust stare, surprisingly, that it wasn't that big of a concern. But they were saying lateral vibration was an issue, that they could stand there and they could get it rocking back and forth. So I said, okay, well maybe that, that one wouldn't be something most engineers would even think to check. That's a, that's a valid point. Let's do some calculations on that. So I went back, dug in, and we definitely met the criteria for lateral vibration. But again, this is about perception. So I was like, okay, get someone else to go up the stair. Um, rather than someone else from that team going up, one of the architects went and he's like, I cannot force it to do what they're saying to do it. And I said, okay, well, sometimes um, the, the impact can be that they don't have all the mass on it. Remember I said that for stiffness and vibration, all of the things that don't contribute to strength, you actually get to use in that calculation. So they went and as they started to build it up, we got no more complaints. I had to write several memos. Um, we had to get that load test done anyway. Um, when they actually did hang the one kilonewton pound from it, I think they calculated that it moved less than a millimeter, which is less than the precision of a measuring tape. So 
Um, Gary made it move about exactly what we expected one Gary to make it move. Um, so all in all, everyone's been very happy with that stair. Um, I've heard no complaints um, from its use. So now I'm just going to show you some images of as they started to put it in. You can see the glass guard, guard there and then the, the handrail kind of separate from it. Um, and here it is kind of in its finished use with people going down the stairs. Um, I am probably going to do a quick blip for you guys. It's going to come back as nothing for you because um, uh, I'm going to go deal with my children. I'm going to be wearing a different outfit probably because I'll be in my jammies at that point. But I'm assuming all of you are watching this in your jammies and we're just going to roll with it. Um, so I'm just going to stop this now and I'll pick back up in a little while. Okay, for you it's only been a few seconds, for me it's been several hours, a very fun-filled, packed several hours. My four-year-old got stung by a hornet moments after I stopped recording moments ago to you. Uh, so we've been monitoring that closely. He's got a very swollen foot and is very uncomfortable. Um, Dave was going to join me to kind of finish up these slides, but he's going to do it in a separate part, which again will mean nothing to you because it'll be amended to it. I don't feel that, I understand why I feel the need to explain it, but I do. Um, you can see that it's dark now and it's somewhat later in the evening. Um, uh, I'm going to try to keep my voice a little bit lower than I might normally recording these simply because uh, my four year old's asleep and we just is on Benadryl and a few other meds to kind of control that. And, uh, yeah, fun. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on with the next example stare. Some of you have probably seen this photographed. Um, some of you have probably worked with Shane Williamson. Um, I worked pretty closely with Betsy on this. Um, absolutely gorgeous house, um, multi-generational home. Uh, but they wanted it to mean something. They wanted it to represent something and they wanted it to be beautiful. Uh, Blackwell did the base building, um, and Williamson Williamson came to me for the stair. Um, it was a joy to work on this. It was a slightly different setup the way than the way we normally do. I, I never actually produced what you would call a normal set of contract documents. Um, because they had a contractor on board and somebody who was up for and willing to build this stair, um, it was more of a, a conversation and um, putting ideas back and forth as they went to build it. Um, and then interaction with Blackwell on how we supported it at the end conditions. Um, so this one is a curved stair. It has the, the outer portion curved and the inner portion curved. Um, there's some benefits to this, that you have kind of a, a smaller footprint. You don't have that the same massive cantilever. Um, and sometimes having a circle can kind of do some really good things for distributing your loads. Sorry, there's fruit, fruit flies around my wine. Um, uh, so in some respects, the loads were somewhat manageable, which meant we could really go, and it's a small, um, a small stair in a residence, so we could use lower loads. Um, and we were able to go to a, a, a much more unconventional construction method, but actually quite simple in the end. Um, the biggest problem is, is getting any material to curve like that. Um, concrete's pretty much the only thing you normally can get to curve at that tight of a radius, simply because you don't actually curve it, you cast it in that shape. And that's one of the reasons concrete's often used for kind of these beautiful curved elements. Um, you need to be able to curve your formwork, but you could possibly even do it by cutting it and making it into sections. This is not a concrete stair. Um, it's primarily wood. Um, and the reason steel is often a problem in things is, like I mentioned, local buckling. Um, but if you can confine the elements that are prone to local buckling, um, you can get them to do some wonderful things. So. Um, here were, was my design notes for this stair. Um, you can see that we used a live load of 1.9 kPa. Um, you could barely pass people on the stairs. Um, it's not one that's going to get the large loads that we would typically see. Um, even if they had a party and fully loaded that stair, 1.9 kPa seems pretty realistic. 
Um, it was modeled in my modeling software. And we talked through vibration and they said that, you know what, they were, they were comfortable um, as long as we did the one kilonewton check. Uh, they were comfortable with um, kind of eliminating the, those tight vibration considerations. They were, they were, they were willing to um, feel the potential for some small discomfort because that's the thing about these vibration calculations. We do them in, his, in anticipation of the problem, but often because um, there's more finishes than we even anticipate that can dampen um, and limit transmission of vibration and change the acceleration um, that even in a calculated problem, we might have a slightly different frequency than we thought um, or a slightly different weight than we anticipated. Um, and so sometimes we don't have a problem when we think we might, and sometimes we do have a problem or a, a perceived problem when we calculate we don't. So vibration, like Dave mentioned, is a, is a really interesting problem to solve. Anyway, these clients were, were willing to take the slight risk that there would be some small vibration, understanding that there's no life safety and no serviceability issues, um, that they were willing to risk some small potential for vibration transmission um, to proceed with this stare as, as it wanted to be. Um, so here was my loading calculation. Again, not too much that you need to worry about. Here's my model. Um, again, it's not, these models aren't meant to be, um, visually stimulating. They can be kind of interesting, um, but they'll do weird things. It's not, um, it's not your drawing production software. It is primarily about doing structural analysis and complex um, mathematical analysis, not um, modeling to produce contract documents. Um, so you can see that I modeled it in a series of straight line segments um, that's then meshed to see what the loads are on it. Um, in this one, a big part of vibration um, and deflection is actually the base building conditions. Um, the last one we had was sitting on a concrete floor. So a lot of the problems kind of dissipate into the concrete floor and go away. This one, we have steel framing and steel framing that the stair is sitting on. So we really needed to build that into our model and see what the impacts are on the building or what the building's impacts are on the stair as well. Here's the free body diagram. This one, you can see why it's really important that we include it because there's there can be some long spans here um, and even if the load's coming on here it might not get resolved to way over there so we really want to take a look at how it impacts especially on these sort of projects where the support elements are big relative to the stair we really need to take a look at that analysis we still always have to do it um, but I might do that as a check um, or just provide the base building engineer with the loads whereas this one I really wanted to work closely with Blackwell to say, um, you have to check this, but I'm pretty sure you don't have a problem because I've done this analysis. Here's what the loads are. You do your due diligence and double, triple check it, but I'm confident that you're not going to run into a problem. And we needed to know that because, you know, this was so closely tied to what was happening as it was being constructed. Um, so for this one, it was really kind of a, a unique setup. Oh, I can... The kids must both be asleep. I can hear Dave coming downstairs. It's his night to put them to sleep. Um, so the way we built... Are you about to try to shimmy? Do you want a glass of wine? I have a glass of wine. They're not waking up. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the way this one was built was really kind of cool. Um... We needed the curvature, but it, you can't you can't curve steel any steel members that tight just because they usually have a flange. Plate you can curve quite easily. So, but the plate by itself would buckle. It needed something on it. If you guys remember back when we talked about composite beams and load sharing beams, we talked about something called flitch beams. And flitch beams are where we either put steel between wood or wood between steel um, because uh, we can kind of reduce the cross-sectional area somewhat. We can make it narrower. It's usually not the first place you go, um, but in this, we wanted elements that we could bend easily. 
So what we did is, and I, I came up with a suggested construction method. Um, the contractor tweaked it somewhat because I don't always know what their shop looks like. I, I've, uh, um, different shops have different ways they can do things. So I'm always trying to anticipate, can they build this? How can they build this? How can this go together? Um, so uh, he did most of the, the he, his name happened to be Peter. If you're wondering who Peter is, Peter was the contractor. That's why I keep saying him. Um, he, he, what he did was he curved plywood, um, in the radius and then he put the treads on it and then we came in and curved steel plate, but the steel plate went underneath the treads and risers. Uh, we had to come up with a screw pattern for connecting those two things together. You can see a close up here of how the steel actually just flies underneath those like that. Um, and then, uh, uh, we talked about the possibility of adding in stiffeners. Um, and some of this was kind of on the show. We didn't, we thought that if there was a vibration problem, once it was installed, we wanted to be able to go back and do some remediation work. So we came up with some plans of things we could do that we felt might stiffen this up that involved kind of embedding things underneath here. Uh, then the idea was that they would put plywood pickets on because we also needed to incorporate the guard portion of this as well. So now these pickets could be attached to the plywood, or not the pickets, I guess these were the um, upstands. And then they could come back and infill with plywood and then put a finished thin veneer of um, uh, visual plywood on the outside and the inside um, so that we had a very thin sandwich of these assemblies. I can't remember what the entire thickness ended up being, but it was very, very thin. We had a couple three-eighths, three three-eighths, and then two finish layers. Anyway, it was it was a very narrow, narrow, narrow assembly. Um, you know, and this is the this is the finished product. This one was just kind of interesting because it went so smoothly. Um, something like this you expect, you know, difficulty, pushback. Uh, it was very unique. Um, but you know the, the contractor was fabulous. He he took the idea and ran with it very open, he, taking lots of pictures, um, asking questions at the right time. Um, so I have no good stories about it because it went so smoothly. Um, it's always the ones that have difficulty that you have the good stories about. So, you know, a winner of a project um, that went off kind of uh, in such a fabulous way. It really helped that the architects were so thoughtful about the possible problems that could come up and respectful of the feedback that they were given. Um, you know, when we talked about vibration, there was an inherent understanding of the purpose of the conversation and when and where we should and shouldn't bother with, with certain elements. Like Dave said, you know, what's the, what's the risk here? What's the perceived problem that we could encounter? Uh, just another amazing image of that. Um... So this is the um, Canada's Diversity Gardens, uh, or the Assiniboine Project, by KPMB and Architecture 49 in partnership. Um, uh, so the stair is this, this portion right here, this little kind of tidbit down here. Um, Blackwell did the, the base building, and by base building I mean all of this beautiful net and then all of this steel, all of this steel right here. Um, still under construction, um, you know, they run into weather problems, um, there was kind of some anticipated things happening on site. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and unanticipated things happening on site of a project this unique. There's, there's no precedent. Um, things that are solved again and again and again um, that you couldn't pop, that you should definitely just know are problems and you can solve them. It doesn't exist on this project. So, um, you know, 
kind of each scope has its new set of challenges. So the STAIR, um, KPMB asked me to get involved in it. Blackwell was kind of busy doing the overall part of the building. Um, and sometimes it's just nice to have to break up the scope. So they asked me to get involved. Um, what KPMB really wanted was um, essentially a perforated steel plate system. Originally, wasn't it going to be mesh? Not even, like it was going to be a, mm -hmm. almost like snow fence. Yeah, and stainless steel. And stainless steel, so like a stainless steel mesh. Um, that wasn't really practical, and there was a few other problems with it. Um, so we moved to perforated steel plate. One of the reasons that was really cool is they were able to um, make the holes in the pattern they wanted. So where we needed lots of strength, they could limit the density of the holes and the openings in it. Um, and where it was doing very little work, they could really open up that pattern. Um, so again, well, I'll, I'll get to some images in a second. So here is the, um, the, the loading situation again you're starting to see a pattern where I have you know kind of it broken out into treads in the guards um, this one's really interesting because um, like I said what we use in the strength design and what we use in the vibration design of the elements might be different because we can we're allowed to include um, everything in stiffness and but in stiffness and vibration um, so uh, I have to keep a model where it's only things that are working hard structurally for my structure, but then I can add things to, to aid in the analysis of um, stiffness and vibration. Um, we, it was going to be too hard to model all of the preparations, so one of the things we did is said, okay, you can limit your preparations to this amount, and we did a localized analysis of stress distribution around those holes. And we saw that it was equivalent to this thickness of steel. So, um, you know, if we had two inches of steel, it wasn't two inches, but if you had two inches of steel and you, you could put holes at this size in this amount of a pattern, that would be the equivalent of the entire thing being half an inch of steel. And that's how we did the analysis for the overall modeling. So we looked at local analysis for local preparations, um, but then we did the entire model, um, assuming a much thinner gauge of steel. Um, and this one had almost nothing on it to dampen it or help with vibration. It was just the steel. Uh, so you can imagine that that lends itself um, to vibration issues quite easily. So this one was most definitely governed by vibration, by, it was so easy to get it to work for strength. It was almost, uh, it was just a joke to get it to work for strength. It was so easy. Uh, vibration was the challenge and that was everything that we had to do. It was how do we analyze this in a way that proves that we'll be okay for vibration. Um, so here's what my strength model looked like. Um, you can see that I'm showing um, my pans, uh, there's the, the stringers down the side, um, where, where we did have stringers and then they put plate on it, um, but then the risers and the treads were steel. Here's my free body diagram. Um, vibration, um, I was able to go in and the, the floor is not in there. There's actually a floor modeled in that, but eTabs, my modeling software, kept drawing it up high. It wasn't there. It was just a quirk in the kind of the graphics of the program. Like it's not, like I said, it's not really meant for this. Um, over here in the strength and stiffness one, I modeled them as structural members. Um, what I did over here in the vibration one is I actually modeled them as plate, which to you probably sounds like not a big difference, but eTabs is... Um, a line-based analysis modeling software. So even though it looks like this big member here, when I model it like that, it's just a single little line, like the stick figures we draw in our free body diagrams. So modeling it as a plate element actually adds a lot of um, kind of rigidity to the system for our vibration analysis. And you can see I did the same thing for the risers. I looked at the impact of the guard 
Um, and you can see that I included a separate model for the guard and handrail. Um, but they were connected in such a limited way to the stair itself that it looks like it, it, you can't see it in these images. Um, and I'll try to find some images for it for our guard and handrail lecture. Um, that it, it, even though it's, um, it's infilled with perforated plate, it looks like it's this solid stringer very similar to the Senate project that I showed you, except that it was connected so remotely and so discreetly um, that we were making that work for strength and stiffness, but it actually gave us no benefit for our vibration analysis. These pieces did, but the rest really didn't add much to it. So it was easier to keep that out of the model. So we pulled, I pulled it from the model and it just made kind of analysis that much easier. Uh, and here is um, kind of the rendering of the stair itself. If you go to that link that I showed you, um, it's the KPMB site. They have a fantastic 3D video of a walkthrough of the building. Um, this is a still capture from that video. Um, it's really the only place I could find any images of the stair. What they had originally wanted was no risers. Um, the interesting thing there is, is that we're curving um, our stairs and they also needed to have their riser kind of at a sloped angle. There's there's rules and Winnipeg is, is wonderfully kind of concise about this, um, about how far your foot needs to go back to hit a kick plate, but then how your toe drags up. Um, and the idea there being that um, visually impaired people use will use their toe and um, a walking stick to kind of help lead them up that stair. Um, and uh, the problem with that is they couldn't kind of the steel needed to be warped because it needed to curve and it needed to, to bevel almost. Um, so uh, kind of the logistics of getting that to happen became very difficult. So we had kind of had to work through that. And that's one of the reasons why it wasn't structural as well. There's all kinds of funny little quirks about this project. Um, they originally had wanted no riser, but they needed it for the kick plate. Um, and we put that in. Um, you can see here that they had wanted an expanded mesh that was so fine that it was almost transparent. Um, in the end, it wasn't structure that governed that. It became about workability, availability. Um, I, there was, was it, I don't even remember if there was any code issues around it, about that mesh. I don't think there was. Um, Anyway, they made the, the transition to the perforated steel plate, but they wanted it to seem very airy. They wanted you to be able to catch glimpses of things through the perforations. So I'm going to talk about one more example, and then I'm going to hand it off to Dave. This is a steel stair, plate steel, um, with a cantilevered, um, switch back, but it's a switch back with multiple landings. You can see we've got one, two, three landings on this stair. Um, Shim Sutcliffe, you can find zero renderings. Um, I can't even find any reference to it of this project on the internet anywhere. Top secret. Anyway. This stair is just bent plate. Bent plate, nothing else. That's it. It's got um, some bits up here for the handrail and a little bit of finishes on it. If you've seen any of the work by Shim Sutcliffe, you'll know that there's a very kind of concise aesthetic style that they work to. Um, these images do not do it justice. Um, I am highly looking forward to seeing the finished stair if I ever get to. I still haven't even seen any of the images of the Moscow project that we worked on. We actually went to Moscow to kind of look at the, the beginnings of the project and the site um, in 2014, but I've seen no images of that. Have you seen images of that project? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apparently I'm not on the in list. I don't get to see the pictures of that. Anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing pictures of this set of stairs. Overall, analysis was pretty good. We did um, a vibration check. For this one, we did the one millimeter with 
uh, under one millimeter for one kilonewton of load, move without well within the tolerance. It's an exterior stair, um, so they weren't too worried about vibration. Um, it's one of those things, if you're on a pedestrian bridge, your ability to accept that motion seems slightly more appropriate. Um, so the context of the thing changes people's perception of the problem as well. So this one, we were okay kind of moving on with this. Um, the biggest problems is that stress, if you guys remember when we talked about tension, there was two things we had to check. There was the net area um, where we used our FY, the way we normally did. But where we had a bolt hole, we would use FU, and we would assume that the stresses would move around that hole. And that's what allowed us to use our ultimate stress instead of our yielding stress. Normally for everything we use our yielding stress, but in that situation, we, we were looking at the cross-sectional area with our hole removed, and we used FU. And that's because the stresses can kind of work their way around things a little bit. You'll get some localized stresses, um, but that's okay. And that's why we use the FU, kind of up the limit a little bit. That works really well on round holes. Um, cutting things with a sharp edge, stresses do not like that. They can't kind of migrate around that. And that's where you end up, you'll end up with, with cracking at those spots or failure. So um, often if we have to cut a square in a steel plate, we'll often specify a round hole, like you'll core that first and then cut down to it to try to eliminate that problem. But in this situation, it was actually visual. So um, we had some spots that we were able to look at the stresses and just see that they were so nominal it wasn't a problem. We had one location where the stresses were high enough um, that we ended up detailing a method where they actually had a small hole in it. We, we actually built in a small hole in the steel to allow the stresses to distribute properly around that area to kind of get rid of that kind of large stress zone. Um, so if you look at the global stresses on my stairs, you can imagine that everything that's yellow is easy peasy, working no problem. You know, things start to bump up here, but where you start to see lots of color, that's where we're starting to get high stresses. And so if I just take a little zoom in right here, you can see that there's lots going on here. We've got lots of sharp edges happening right at what would be the mid-span of a beam on the inner stringer, which I said is, so we know mid-span of a beam is where the moment is highest, which sucks. That's what we're trying to kind of, that's usually what governs steel design. The inner stringer is the one that's working the hardest, and this is along the inner string stringer. And we know that corners are really kind of crappy in steel. So we've got kind of this perfect storm of problems right here on this problem. And so we ended up kind of detailing a small hole right in that spot. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, are you ready to go right now or do you want me to stop this and you'll come over when you're ready? No, no, I'll come over now. Okay. I can kind of sit in and, and, and listen in somewhat, trying to periodically. So there's one or two in here that either of us might have designed, but for the most part, these are just interesting ones. <laughs> interesting ones from the internet. Uh, so bear in mind that um, we don't know backstory to these stairs. We're inferring a lot from looking at a picture, the same way you guys do when you look at precedent projects. Um, so we're trying to back engineer these based on a simple picture. So we'll try to give you some context and some interesting stories. Some of them might just be a cool picture and be like, yep, that's a stair. Um, but some of them we might be able to come up with a really interesting story. This lecture is turning out to be longer than I anticipated, so we'll try to keep it short. Um, there's a few, there's a few stairs to look at, so... so you can make it up in your, in your guard lecture, because that's probably a shorter one. It's one third, there's, it's a third of a module. What oh. are we doing? I was going, advancing to the next slide. There we go. There we are. Um, okay, so this is, you, you, um, 
You may recall the images of the. Um, can they see the? They can. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. So you, what they're seeing is mm -hmm. actually this. So yeah, so they can see the little arrow. They can see the mouse. Sweet. Yeah. Okay, so so you remember this the image of the side stringers. Um, so this particular stair has has two side stringers, suspended tread in between. This would be a, a really bouncy stair to experience for a number of reasons. Um, Primary, well, for one thing, if you look at the tread, is extremely thin. So, so it would be bouncy in between the side stringers. Um, but the primary reason is that there is zero damping in this stair. Damping makes a gigantic difference in, in your perception of vibration. Um, and um, uh, Shannon told the story about the, the Senate stair, um, how it was perceived to be a real problem. The problem went away as soon as finishes were installed. Not that finishes add stiffness, but they add vibration. Every time you have two uh, dissimilar materials rubbing against each other, um, they they damp the vibration, they absorb energy, um, and reduce the feedback. So this one with zero um, zero damping would be a, a, a stair that vibrates. One of the challenges on this stair from our building code, if you look at the the which hand refers to as pickets, the infill piece. Um, they're all horizontal. They may very well resist the load they're supposed to resist, but they're horizontal, which means this guard is climbable. Ontario has a regulation that uh, the guards can't be climbable, and so you can't have horizontal pickets. There's rumors that that's going to change because a lot of places in the world have slowly been eliminating that clause. We've heard two things about that. We did hear it was going to get taken out, and then we've since heard not a chance. If anything, other places might bring it back. <laughs> we have a guard that we built out of welded wire mesh on our deck, and our two and a half year old is obsessed with climbing it. So I kind of get where it's coming from. Yeah, climbability is a little bit hard to hard to describe. So so certainly horizontal rails like this one very very climbable. If you have a, a mesh like a chain link. Um, the pool regulation says that that uh, they need to be a non-climbable fence, but they consider a one and a quarter inch diamond chain link to be not climbable um, uh, from a pool point of view. But the code doesn't really describe what climbable means. Um, so that's a little bit up to interpretation, but certainly fine meshes, uh, fine diagonal or woven meshes um, are often acceptable. From a climbability point of view, another stair with parallel parallel stringers. Um, on this one, you can see that the stringer is built up, in, or the landings and the actual stringers are built up in thickness, which will increase their stiffness. Um, this one was hung from the floor. You can see to cut the span of that particular stringer, which would have stiffened things up as well. This one appears to have no uh, infill whatsoever but i think it's actually glass i think that that's a that's just a very yeah. clever photography yeah i think yeah. you can see that there's a slight reflection right there yeah so glass as you can imagine is is not um is not climbable it's a perfect infill not climbable and and uh it won't allow the four inch ball to pass through um this is beautifully detailed. You can see what's, what they've done here is they've cantilevered the glass up out of the stringer. So whereas mm. the previous stair had vertical pickets. You, you, want really wanted, you, know, you really wanted this to be about in the guard lecture. that He used to have the stairs and guards in the lecture he's done before mixed together. So this right. was very much about the guards. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll skip this one and toss it in our guard lecture. Yeah, okay, next week. for sure. But, you know, this is, this is an yeah. integration of stair, stringer, and guard, oh, sure. right? Yeah. So the, the stair stringer is probably a box. It'd be, it'd be a deep U with a crossing plate so that, so that um, you've got enough embedment for the, glass, uh, for the glass guard to cantilever up. Which is very much like Senate. Senate was very much yeah. like this. Actually, um, for Senate, what they did was the steel was the working piece. The glass shoe was anchored down on top, and then they clad the whole thing in bronze as one element. So it looked like this, that the shoe and the stringer were one integral piece, but they weren't, they were, they were all clad. Um, one thing you can see, this is an open riser, which is not permitted under certain uh, accessibility rules. Um, uh, 
but it's got a glass tread for, for transparency. A glass tread, you can do a laminated glass tread that will span from, from, uh, from stringer to stringer on its own. And being laminated, if one of the light, glass light breaks, it doesn't actually fall out of the opening. So it's safe in that respect. But um, typically with glass treads, they're set in a frame for nosing protection because somebody's walking up with a hard object, they can knock out, knock that nosing and damage the uh, damage the nosing of the stair very easily. This one, you can see, it's a switchback stair with with a central column, uh, a central landing support. I can tell you that if Fat Lab designed this, it very likely would not have the column there. This is a stair type that, that was extremely common in the 90s and early 2000s, the central stringer with the, uh, with the, cantilever, the tread. cantilever treads. And, and we're not seeing this as much anymore. And, I, and to be honest, I'm not quite sure why. I was kind of a fan of it. Um, some interesting things to note. So this, is, this looks to be an expanded metal uh, mesh. Um, the, the stair tread is, is a frame. And look how every fourth tread or sorry every fourth riser is stiffened it's not because there's any extra demand on the riser per se it's that every fourth one is picking up the guard picket so the the uh, stair tread itself is fine um, but when we add the guard load on top of it it's uh, it's inadequate and so it had to be stiffened with a gusset and we'll bring we'll bring that one in too when we talk about guards, mm -hmm. just it's hard to kind of break them up, but it was too much to really get into guards the way we wanted to in this lecture. Yeah. Normally, we were just talking about architectural steel, um, but this we kind of wanted to get into the engineering a bit more as well. Once again, a non-compliant guard from a from an openings and, and a climbability point of view. <laughs> there is a shocking amount of projects that even we work on where they keep a non-compliant guard take the photographs and then make them compliant yeah. afterwards. Or, or they do the infill of the plywood, which then they remove as soon as they have their occupancy permit. That too, but we, we can't tell you to do that. No, yeah, that doesn't, that's, no, that's, that's not, not okay. Yeah, it's not okay. No, don't do that. <laughs> um, this appears to be, I meant to point this out when we looked at the galvanized stair earlier, this appears to be galvanized. One thing we've got to bear in mind is that galvanizing is a very hot bath of molten zinc. And um, and shapes that are asymmetric and shapes that are too small, too fine, are really vulnerable to warping in the galvanizing bath. So this appears to be galvanized. Likely, it's gray paint. Um, it would be it would be a real challenge to get something with this kind of precision. It's galvanized. interesting because the handrail looks like it's uh, stainless. Stainless, yeah, it's true. So this might actually be sandblasted stainless. Yeah. Very industrial looking stair. So this is this is an absolutely utility stair, and yet it's it's beautiful. Anyway, um, with a it's it's very beautiful in, in a kind of nineteen eighties or nineties kind of way. But this would have been cutting edge when it was designed. That's right. But lovely. So here, look at this infill up here. You can see that the, the infill up here is a fine mesh. This actually probably would be acceptable because the mesh is is uh, fine enough. It also, it, it doesn't just, and we'll talk about this with guards, it's not just about the, the, the object fitting through it, but there's also a pressure load of someone pushing on it um, in, as a subcategory in the guard load. So it needs to be able to kind of distribute a load being pushed on it as well. You remember in the stair diagrams, we showed two, two different methods of connecting the stair tread to the stringer. We can connect the tread to the side of the stringer, or we can connect the sit the tread on top of the stringer. Um, and so this is an example of the latter. This is a stair that I did that I'm really was was and and remained quite proud of because there's a few clever things in this. Um, one is um, that in a steel stair, typically the uh, the stringer would have to bend. Uh, at the landing, or we'd have to support it at um, you know at this line here. Um, what I did here is I took the glue lamb up right past the bend of the landing, so that it could be a continuous span up to the far side of the landing. If you can see, 
um, which allowed us to, to provide the support at the back side of the landing instead of the near side of the landing, if that makes sense. And and when did you when was this one done? This was like in the nineties. Late nineties, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say. So I mean, you guys are probably looking at this thinking and saying, ah, it's a blue lamp stair, okay, whatever. And it's cool looking, but how is this a big feat? At the time, you, there there was no glue lamp stairs. Yeah, that's right. There just it was, wasn't it was there was just no glue lamp stairs. Like there was barely glue lamp buildings in Ontario. There was a handful of them. BC had more. But it was still really just becoming an archetype, really. The other thing you can see now, this is this is one that was built in Toronto when it was it passed. It was acceptable um, horizontal cables in the guards. They successfully argued that a sloping cable wasn't climbable. I'm not sure how they got around, away with that one. Frankly, they might have had glass infill in addition to the uh, cables up here. But here I do recall that they argued that, that a sloping cable wasn't climbable and uh, and they were successful. The other interesting thing about this is wood connections are notoriously weak, which means that if you're connecting for big forces, you need big connector plates and multiple bolts and fasteners. That was not acceptable to the architect. Um, so what I did is I detailed the, the guard pickets like a hockey stick. Put a hole in the side of the um, in the side of the stringer, an L-shaped picket that came through, and aligned with the one on the other side. Um, and here was a cross-threaded, uh, a, a piece of cross-threaded rod, so that the two pickets came in. Oops. Yeah. I know it's hard, isn't it? You know, get I know, you're not a mirror. <laughs> um, the two pickets come in. They meet each other cross-threaded rod here that draws them in and what that meant is that we didn't need any connectors at all out here so that this detail could be as minimal as as uh, as the architect was hoping to achieve <laughs> okay so this is this is this one's stair always good that i love now I, we don't have our version of this there do we no in this deck I, I really wish we did but i don't think that project was ever photographed um so this is Shiguro Bond's picture window house, and you can see a very, very, very shallow uh, zeb-shaped riser, or, or a zigzagging riser, or stringer, sorry. Um, uh, this has two challenges. One is that it's very shallow, and being very shallow means that it's weak and it's not stiff. Um, so this would be a very flexible stair, even if it was straight. The other thing that this does is you can see that that um the the total length of steel member here if you add up all these segments is about 40 percent longer than if it was straight um the the stiff the, the stiffness is an inverse function of the length or, or the the deflection is a function of about the cube of the length so 40% longer means it's about three times as flexible. So this becomes an extremely flexible stair, not only because it's shallow, but because it zigzags all the way up. Um, we did a, an exercise one time where we modeled this based on this image, just, you know, kind of estimating what the thickness is. What did we, what did we get for the deflection? It was... Eight inches. <laughs> it was... Yeah. It was not like a person walking up the stairs yeah. would move this inches at a time. Yeah, yeah, it was it was crazy. So either there's something more happening in this image, or they took the image and then added the the other things. Yeah. So I get a call one time from an architect saying, "We want to do a great stair. This is the precedent." And so then we started doing those calculations and figuring out how much it moved. And, um, and really concluded that this stair was impossible and that they just photoshopped out the hangers or something. Um, but we rose to the challenge. And, and so our solution to this was, was, first of all, cut this stringer out of plate and camber it along the leg so that you, you, um, you know, instead of making it straight, we made it with a, with a camber. And then we introduced two cables at mid-span that went down to the ground and pre-stressed those cables to pull it to the point that it was straight. Um, the idea being that, that a cable 
a cable can't carry, it can't act like a prop, it can't carry load and compression. But as long as it's pre-stressed and doesn't have a load reversal, so as long as it's in tension, it's just as stiff as if, as if it was a prop. So um, essentially, instead of loading it, you're unloading it. So you before you do anything, you apply a load, and then after that, every time you put the opposite load on it, you're unloading it rather than loading it. That's right, the, yeah. People walking on it are actually releasing some of the load in that element. So that's right. So instead of a column which would have zero load in its neutral state and 500 pounds of load um, when you know when the stair is fully loaded we have a cable that has 500 pounds of tension in its neutral neutral state and goes to zero when the, the uh, stair is fully loaded and so then the way they installed this is they they put it in it was, it was all cambered they sandbagged it until it sat, sat flat and then installed the cables and tightened them up which is a trick we have used on many projects since then. And every time people are like, this is incredible. Well, actually, in fact, the Solaris house, right? Yeah. The, 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 pool, the pool roof at the Solaris house was a uh, 100-foot span, 30-meter span. And C. McAreary, the architect, wanted it to be 800 millimeters deep um, on a 30-meter span, which is, which is extraordinarily shallow. Um, so we and to be clear, we had designed it, and he had said 1.2 meters. We designed it all. They had a small model built, and he came in, and it was a, like a 1 to 500 model built. And he came in, and he was like, that's too thick. Just change it all to 800. This was like a year and a half into the project. And he did it. Like, he had the balls to do it. it, was like, yeah. it was just, someday I'm going to have those, that kind of courage to just be like, no, I don't. <laughs> so in that situation, we cambered the roof, preloaded it flat, and then installed all the window mullions were steel plates that were, were pre-stressed in tension and pulled the roof down. H&M on Queen Street. Okay, h &M on Queen is the same thing. Same That's thing. right. Um, this is a stair we did for publicists. And, and uh, the idea was that um, a single riser or a single stringer treads cantilevered out of the stringer the stringer had to be the support for the guard and um, and the whole thing needed to float free of the drywall partition. I wasn't a part of this. Um, the, the effect of that is rather minimal. I'm assuming that was a party wall or a wall that you weren't allowed to have any impact on no, of some sort? No, I don't think so. I think, it was, um, I think it was an architectural move. I think when you're walking up the stair, it's much stronger. Like in, the, yeah. in this photograph, it's not as apparent. But when you're walking up the stair, it's quite strong. And so this, this box stringer has to work for torsion. Um, so uh, because all of the treads on the landing is cantilevered out the side, the... The uh, stringer is a big torsion box. It's split to support the glass. Uh, so the glass has to slip down into the box, but as soon as you split a box, it's no it's longer torsionally box. rigid. So we needed to put a plate across um, to, to put a closed box. So we had two channels with closure plates so that the box is the bottom half and then the channels appear to close it at the top, but don't in fact close it. Okay, this is one of my, my favorite stairs of all, of all time. Not because it's so beautiful. In fact, I actually personally find it just a bit clunky looking. Um, uh, but the structure is so clever. Mm -hmm. This is this stair was engineered by my pal Guy Nordenson in, in uh, New York City. I didn't even realize that I'd used the image in, in multiple lectures without realizing that Guy had done it. Um, but there's a bunch of really clever things here. One is... It appears that they're cantilevering um, boxes out of glass, and uh, which would load this very thin plane of glass in bending, um, which of course is impossible. I mean, I mean, I think it would be impossible. It's certainly impossible at that thickness. What's actually happening is that each tread supports the one above. And then this tread supports that riser, and this tread supports that riser. So you've got this cascading of load down to the bottom. Now, the load above is here, the load below is here. They're eccentric, 
that causes each uh, riser to twist. They're box sections, so they're torsionally rigid, and you can see the connection to the glass here, a flange with multiple fasteners. They're connected to take the torsion into the glass. The glass in plane is extremely strong and stiff. Um, so the glass is doing what the glass can do very well. The, the boxes are doing what the boxes and, do well. And it doesn't take much to resist the torsion. You need something to resist the torsion, but it doesn't take much to resist the torsion. So once you have something, you're probably going most of the way to resist it. I mean, it's a calculation, there's math behind it, but compared to kind of supporting something in a gravity load, that torsion load is very nominal relative to what it would have been carrying a gravity load. So that's the cascading effect, mm -hmm. picking up that. And then the other thing you see this gigantic handrail, that handrail spans the full length of the stair here. Where am I in that? <laughs> oh my god. I know. <laughs> it's impossible. We, we've got to be able to switch our view so that it's mirrored. Um, uh, yeah, so the handrail spans the full length of the stair without intermediate pickets. This is your first half hour. I've done like 14 yeah. hours of this. Yeah. So this is shown in the same uh, one right after the other, very explicitly uh, for a very explicit reason. Um, this stair works the same way. These stone treads cantilever out of the wall. The wall can resist moment, but primarily the load cascades down from one to the next to the next. Um, the, the tread is working in torsion, um, carrying the one above it, and then the torsion is transferred back to the wall. And there are medieval stone stairs that were often built this way. I don't think I included that image. Oh no. Ah, catch you another time. So this is a bit of a theme. Um, stairs cantilevered out of concrete walls. Obviously this one's because, truly cantilevered. Yeah. Um, and there are multiple ways of doing this. This is a fairly common type of detail. Cast in plate and then the steel fabrication welded to the cast in plate. It's very forgiving because the, the cast in plate, if it's not in exactly the right spot, or as you can see in this plate, it's not exactly plumb. Um, it doesn't really matter. The, uh, the steel fabrication gets, gets a field welded to it. You can see the major stuff has been bolted to it. Um, although this is a cast in plate too, and, and you know how we can tell a cast in plate is because we can see the bleed around it. You can see bleeding. You see the dark, slight darkness around this element here. That means that the, the moisture is bled out and it's taken with it some of the uh, the fines. And it's the it's the some, the finest particles, the cement particles, that um, that give it the light color. So when you get bleed through the form, you get a dark zone. The lovely little uh, trusses for the treads. It looks like they were 3D printed, don't yeah. they? Yeah. When this was built, 3D printing wasn't at that stage. Didn't it, it, or didn't 3D, exist. 3D printing was only in sci-fi movies. Yeah. Okay, this is another one that, that I did, which I was very proud of. I did it in like 1990 or something. Um, really, really long time ago. But um, folded plate can we bring out of a, uh, of a stud wall. Um, you can't do that. You can't cantilever out of a stud wall, obviously, um, or maybe not obviously, but I can tell you that you can't cantilever out of a stud wall. Um, this was a stud wall uh, sitting in front of a masonry wall. And so the stud wall in, in, in front was built to the bottom of the stair with a, a, a sawtoothed um, stringer sitting on top of it. And the stair cantilevers passed and is picked up by the masonry wall on the other side with an inverted sawtooth stringer. Uh, so we have just a very conventional residential sawtoothed um, piece of wood. Sawtooths up on the stud wall in the front and down on the stud on the uh, block wall in behind and uh, to create the couple. So that would be like when we have a diving board and we have the, the front span and the backspan 
that the backspan is trying to lift up so he had that that stringer inverted to kind of stop the back of our, the treads from kicking up in space. Now, the thing that, that did not bite me on the ass here, although I have often wondered why I never did, is that um, wood shrinks at about, uh, about a quarter of an inch per foot from, from the moisture content that you buy it from the, from the store until the final season moisture content. Now, a quarter of an inch in a foot is about a sixteenth of an inch in a quarter of a foot. And a quarter of a foot is is a double top plate, for example, um, or uh, or the depth of the, the the depth of the throat of a sawtooth stringer. So we would expect um, somewhere between a sixteenth and an eighth of an inch shrinkage in the uh, in the the height of the stud wall up to the um, up to this the the uh, bottom of the stair and of course you don't get any shrinkage at all in the block wall um, which means and and if you take that shrinkage over a very short arm it means that out at the tip of the cantilever it would have dropped fairly significantly and, uh, and that whole thing would have loosened up um, quite a bit over time um, uh, but that that stair is connected together right like your riser and your treads are connected that, together and that's probably just enough to allow them to yeah and I think they built a lot of stuff on this particular loft project with that uh, with reclaimed material so it was probably so it was a very low moisture much content much different yeah um, if anyone's tried to buy lumber in the past three months like we've done a lot of work outside um, you know the, 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 the lumber is wet like you pick it up and you can feel it it's, it's goo almost especially pressure treat where it's just the lumber just hasn't had the time to cure at all um, so normally, right now, fresh stuff is crazily wet. Pre-COVID, it was, you know, you bought it and it's still dried. But using something reclaimed, it's had months, years, centuries to already dry. So most of that kind of initial, initial shrinkage is gone. So I can't tell you exactly how these treads are cantilever out, but this is of course a theme. And and uh, Shannon showed you some a number of precedents earlier about how how people have dealt with this particular condition um, that have been very effective. Um, this again, similar to the one we saw earlier, you know the tread can cantilever out on its own and carry the weight, but you can't. It, you won't get that tread to also carry the guard picket. So the guard picket sneaks past and bends back into the wall um, so that the, uh, the moment to the, uh, the guard force, the guard force goes back into the wall. So this is the house that, that, uh, that I did with Kevin Weiss from, from uh, at the time it was Weiss Bow. Um, no, it's just Weiss Architecture. Weiss Architecture. Um, so this is a, this was a really exciting one. Um, big uh, architectural concrete wall, uh, feature wall. Uh, he wanted the, the stair to cantilever out. Um, and we were dealing with a number of things. The stair wanted to be an absolute minimal box, um, millwork box. Couldn't have, we needed to respect the, the four inch opening. Um, in fact, it looks like we had to get smaller than that. That looks more like a two and a half or three inch opening, but we had to respect the four inch opening um, for one thing, of course. Um, and then we didn't want, or Kevin didn't want um, a separate system for the guard pickets um, to support the guard. So every single tread picks up its own piece of cantilevered glass. So what we have here is a steel box on the end that the glass sits down and is set into. Um, in order to resist the moment on this, of course, we didn't want big escutcheon plates with multiple bolt um, with multiple bolts. We didn't want cast-in plates. It was really critical that it be a perfectly clean um, condition to the wall. So the wall was poured um, was poured. Uh, intact, unmarked, and then each of these holes was core drilled after the fact, after the wall was poured, so that the steel assemblies could be slipped in and epoxied into place. 
if leaving you, the wall unblemished. If you guys remember, so not only worrying about blemishes and getting that bleed with the fines that Dave mentioned, um, had they done something casting, even they kept it minimal, that casting, you might see the kind of bleed around it. But I've also mentioned that the thing that is wrong on a project the majority of the time is anything casting. It's usually not in the right spot. Not because concrete farm workers are, are doing a bad job. It's just that it's so easy to bump and move around and you have no framework. Like you're placing it in something that doesn't exist. You're trying to place something in a thing that doesn't exist yet. So it becomes the easiest thing to make a mistake on. And like a small mistake really kind of shows up at that level when you're trying to fix fit a piece of steel over it that's been laser cut that can be precisioned down to a millimeter trying to fit it on something cast in concrete becomes really difficult an interesting expanded metal stair um, you know expanded metal is not is not considered particularly rigid particularly out of plane but in plane it's quite rigid so so here we've got a stringer that's actually made of of um, steel rods with uh, expanded metal as an infill. And then, of course, there's the major stringer down the middle. With holes in it for fun. Lightning holes. <laughs> you know, when I heard the, when I first heard the expression of lightning holes, I was trying to figure out what they were meaning. Like, does the, is the lightning expected to pass through the hole or... And I was super embarrassed when I realized that it means, oh, it just makes it lighter. <laughs> lightning. <laughs> but I kind of like the notion of lightning passing through them. Like, picture a lightning bolt. <laughs> this I found to be to be a particularly interesting stair. Like, so, so the so the millwork detailing is really quite beautiful. You can see that there's a center uh, sawtooth. Uh, stringer at the back but not only that but the the guard here is acting like a truss as well and hanging the stair at, at uh, uh, let's come at back let's bed. let's skip over them because that one's cool to talk about in the mm -hmm. guard the mm -hmm. guard element there's some things that yeah. so here's obviously a very beautifully detailed concrete stair um this is one of those ones that has the challenge of extremely difficult detailing of um, um, the rebar through this. I suspect, and maybe you're going to confirm this, Shannon. I suspect that if we if we saw a different view, we would see that there was actually a um, um, a gable, like a concrete gable, kind of halfway in, that's set far back in, far enough back in that you're not aware of it. You can see the precedent for that. That's right, right in right here. Right there. So it's set far enough back in that it doesn't wear of it, that you're not aware of it, so that it makes it appear that the stair is, is spanning this way, but in fact it's cantilevering out from a from a central wall. And I mean this is not structure, but but I actually really love the way they've done this wood floor treatment to look like a carpet. So this is extremely clever. So, so this was an architect who wanted a very, very fine detail um, along the edge. But of course, the stair has to span this way. And, um, and that is not enough depth to span. It, it doesn't matter how cl cleverly you detail the rebar. But by bellying the stair like this, you actually, you know, the bottom is bellied. The top is obviously straight because you have to walk on it. And at, at the mid span of the stair, you've actually got a reasonable amount of depth. So the center, the, the kind of the mid width of this stair um, encapsulates a beam that can span. Essentially, it's the concrete version of one stringer down the middle. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can see that there is a uh, there is a guard with openings that are far too big that is clearly climbable. <laughs> Not sure there's much to to say about this. This is a, a spiral stair. It is interesting that that spiral stairs are done this way. That that it's a series of stacked cylinders, so that every tread comes with its section of cylinder, and they stack one inside the other. Um, but that's quite a conventional detail. This is something that that actually is obvious on this one, that the guard is higher than the handrail. So. 
So a guard, you're, that's right, you're going to talk about guards later. We, we can, but we're pushing the yeah. time. Oh, These sorry. four people. Right. Uh, another spiral at, at, um, at the Palm House at Kew Gardens. Um, this one, you can see that the stair is actually supported, or it's, it's not supported, it's suspended, I believe, um, around the perimeter. So this is, uh, this is Gaudi Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, um, a spiral stair. Um, in this case, actually, the, the, the center string is actually doing some work. So Ivy Eurykna has done some extraordinary, extremely, extremely light stare. It's sort of the master of fine filigree. Um, all of these things act like trusses and space frames. Um, the really amazing thing is, is this center, um, the center support that's cut out of a, a piece of pipe. What's truly amazing is this was done kind of at the beginning of kind of all the high tech technology we use now for analysis and I think most engineers now would get there was kind of this brief period where we didn't have the skills to do complex analysis and then there was this brief time where we got some software that helped us out and now we're too caught up in software it's almost like engineers don't know how to kind of stop and understand when the program isn't is is like that point where I talked about uh, where you're cutting around an opening or a sharp edge in steel. Like when you need to stop and look at it at a broader picture and stop depending on the black box of the analysis software. And this came in that sweet spot in between the two mm -hmm. kind of ends of the way we think about things. That's true. We're, we're, too, we're, we're too focused on, on uh, solutions that are too precise to, to make this feasible really or yeah. reasonable anyway now whereas uh whereas at the time the, the analysis wasn't wasn't as advanced which meant there was room for more judgment but it was just the beginning of advanced analysis yeah. okay this was really fun um this is all key clamp hardware which is readily available it's often used in the lighting industry and for te for temporary things um it made an interesting uh stare it looks like an economical solution this stuff is crazy expensive it is much cheaper just to fabricate something bespoke than it is to use key clamp hardware so it winds up being being you know a very explicit aesthetic this is another extraordinary extraordinary stare this was done by yalis in the 70s or 60s um Prior to to uh, advanced structural analysis, there was no computer analysis software at the time. Um, so Rolly Bergman, who is was an absolutely brilliant engineer, um, conceived this thing, analyzed it by hand, and then they built a um, uh, they built a scale model and tested it, and uh, and then it found a way of extrapolating from a one quarter scale. Uh, test model to, to prove out the uh, the final. And as you guys remember from, you know, depth for stiffness and strength and length, um, that things aren't linear. So a scale model isn't a linear representation of reality. So you have to actually, there's actually calculations involved in even understanding how the scale model represents reality. That's right. Like some things would be linear, some things would be a function of square of the cube. Um, one thing that's interesting is, is about this this kind of helical form is there is actually a funicular load path in here. So um, so funicular funicular form you you may remember is like an arch. You know where everything works is an axial load. Um, in a helix like this, there is a funicular load path, which means that the funicular load path is very stiff. Um, so there is a load path here that's very stiff. And then this wide flat thing that has to only resist tension or torsion and unbalanced loads. Um, concrete spiral stair. Um, I, think the, I think the big achievement here is not a structural one. It's a. It's how do you get such beautiful, um, such beautiful concrete? Okay, the IMP stair, the Louvre. 
This is interesting because look at how deep it is. So, so it looks very, very shallow on the edge, but of course the bottom side is tapered very, very deep here. And the inner stringer is the one doing the majority of the work. Yeah. So, so the inner stringer could be a big, a big box and, uh, and can't leave it out. Yeah. There's a lot happening in there. It'd be interesting to see the structural cross section, um, that the soffit is hiding. Yeah. Engineered by Peter Rice, probably, I'm assuming, given that it was moved. Tension column. Um, so this is a this is doing the work of a column, but it's all but it's all in uh, in tension, and this the stair is suspended from from above. I don't um, think I've ever fully appreciated this one before. Yeah. Um, this one, you can see that we've got we do have um, glass treads. If you look closely, you can see that it is laminated glass. So that's two lights with a with an interlayer. Um, there is no nosing protection on this one, so it's a little bit of a a little bit of a yes. vulnerable stare. Yeah. Another one. So inside stringer doing all the work. So this is interesting. Within the guard, they've added, used a steel plate, which would do much of the work of the stringer. Um, so there's the actual stringer, and then there's a big steel plate to stiffen it up, which allows the uh, the outside edge to be very, very thin. And then the risers and treads are just built up, no work, essentially. Suspended glass stair. So the, the riser doing the work, suspending the, um, uh, suspending the tread. Do you know what stair isn't in here? Stuart House. Stuart House. Jesus. We've got to catch <laughs> that. That's what made me think of this, is that, that we've done this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've done this better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love this stair because, because it, it looks like an upside down photograph. So um, <laughs> they've, they've just detailed the, uh, the underside of the stair to look like the top of the stair, which, which is obviously just extremely playful. Um, millwork stair. Um, this is interesting. So, so we've actually sort of done done things like this ourselves, yeah. where you where you do a double height or a triple height, and and so you wind up mixing uh, stairs and bleachers. Yeah, we're kind of we kind of are obsessed with this idea of having a a, a bleacher built into your stairs. For us, we'll often do it um, in a spot where we don't want to have a guard, and so we might bleacher down to a lower level. Um, and then build steps into it. So we might build the bleachers and then have small sections of steps, kind of eliminating that guard need. Um, that is going to happen at Daniels. That, that's uh, right. Darwin's Hill. Darwin's Hill, the, 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 the big deal, the big hill. Um, that's exactly what it's at. That's right. Uh, another millwork, millwork box there. Concealing storage and probably a bathroom, given the, the moon on the back. Given the moon. Uh, suspended stair. This is interesting. So, so we've got um, the stair is suspended on cables and rods. No stringers. Um, a cable and a rod, a, a pure tension element, um, is is going to perform very poorly in vibration because when the load is going down, adding tension. You know, the vibration is of course is, is cyclic. It's um, uh, it's a sine wave, and half the time it's going up, half the time it's going down. Um, when it's going down, adding load, the cable has full stiffness. When it's going up, the cable has zero stiffness because it'll buckle. So, so cables are inherently poor, typically, or, or tension-only elements are inherently poor for vibration. Um, the exception to that is <clears throat> when they're under pre-stress. So if you've got something heavy, like these stone treads, and the vibration, the load associated with vibration is very small. You will never overcome the, the natural pre-stress in it, and so they will actually be quite stiff. So even though it's pushing up with that, that example you gave earlier of like 3% of, uh, of gravity, it's never going to unload the stair. Yeah. So this would be a nice... A nice stiff stair, even though it's suspended on something that is inherently not. This is what I love. I love this one because you've got your pickets built in. They're not quite four inches apart, but 
we could imagine you could easily build that mm -hmm. in to mm -hmm. that system. Another EV Eurythmus there. We won't even begin to try. I, I, I at one time in a lecture tried to draw the free body diagram of this, and, and then I gave up and never tried again. Um, because there is just too much going on. Um, this is interesting. You know, it's a text there. This looks like very much like um, Renzo Piano. Yeah, I can't remember the, the, the project. Um, anyway, it's, it's sort of this reversing truss where we've got a tied arch here and a bowstring here mm -hmm. um, uh, in order to achieve this pad. Now, this particular stair, I think, would be a very challenging to demonstrate code compliance. Well, maybe not. It's probably constant rise and run. Um, and then and then we've got this landing at the top that that um, that's curved, but as long as it's not more than 1 to 20, then... Um, then it's probably okay. Um, look at the detail at the base. Like, you can't see. The rocker. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That very dangerous looking pointy thing. This one um, is particularly interesting because look, we've got, here we have a steel truss, top cord, bottom cord, no web. So naturally, an engineer would tell you, well, it's not a, it's not a truss it's not then. A truss. It's two beams. It's a tiny little beam at the top and a tiny little beam at the bottom, and it doesn't work. But what the architect has done, and I'm certain this was the architect's idea, and, and twisted the engineer's arm, the treads and risers forming a Z is actually the diagonals of the web of uh, if you of took a that, truss. If you took that and tipped it on its side, those pieces of glass are your struts. I like this one. I know, I know, me too. Super clever. It's, and even it's though super simple. We have seen so many treads cantilevered out of walls that you would think that this wouldn't wouldn't kind of hold up. But it's just so clever. And and uh, one of the great things about this is that interconnecting two treads here provides end fixity so that whereas normally um, a cantilever tread would sag down like this. From one person standing on the tip. Um, when we have, when we connect them, it doesn't. It, it's, it, it takes an S curve. It has to keep a right angle because that's a moment connection. And remember, moment connection means you have to maintain a right angle at and, that point. And so the S curve is what, twice as stiff? Four times as stiff? I don't know, but it's, it's dramatically stiffer than a simple cantilever, which allowed it to be done out of thin plate. And it depends what the K is, but yeah. The K. Um, Antimax stair, so this is a this is an all glass, well, all glass, glass and steel frame stair um, for Antimax in Toronto, built by Pengeli Ironworks. Oh, that's in here twice. We liked it so much because it because it's that good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was kind of our our summation of our stair lecture. Um, so we went through basic loading for stairs, and that's something you guys should know. We're gonna it's not a it's not a quiz, but it is going to be in a quiz format. Um, your two assignments on Quercus. You'll have a week to do them. You can take your time. Um, but things like talking about loading criteria for stairs would be a good example for that. You know, this is a, it's a friggin' elective. You guys are here because you want to be, you want to learn the stuff, but we have to have some way to kind of um, mark your progress. So think of things that are kind of good concrete numbers. I'm not, we're not trying to trick you or mess you up. Um, some of you may feel that I do that from your exams in your uh, core classes, but really, that's not that's not the goal here. With the core courses, there are some things that I'm kind of mandated to do. This is literally we want you to just lock that number away in your head. Um, so when can serviceability be an issue? What when can vibration govern? Um, and just be aware. And this is just for you going forward that construction and sequencing can have a big impact on how we build these stairs. And that precedent can be really helpful. 
Um, but there's lots of context sometimes hidden in that precedent that we don't know about. What's happening behind the, the scene? What's what's hidden by the soffit? What's happening in the wall that we can only infer? Like Dave's stare that went back through the stud wall and hit the masonry. That would not be apparent to another engineer looking at that design. Um, so next week we'll look on, at guards and handrails, and that's just one module. Um, with, I can't remember the full the full breakdown of next week's. Um, we're obviously running a little bit behind. Luckily, this is only a 10-week program in a 12-week embedded program, and I actually thought class started a week earlier. So we're running, we're running about on schedule now. I wanted to be ahead of schedule, um, but that's not playing the way we thought. Things are going to get a little bit better. Um, I had, there was a lot of kind of upfront creating of lectures and kind of producing things on Quirkus for the other two courses. Um, that's been a little bit overwhelming. Um, that was not anticipated. Forgetting COVID, like just that alone is a massive kind of undertaking. Um, and then tossing in all the other kind of restraints around the world and um, having two small kids home. So we're thinking of you guys. Uh, it might not seem like it, but we are. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to get things out ahead of schedule. So stair lecture complete. We're going to go have a glass of wine before we conk out because it's late for us. All right. We're not having a stroke. This is what my screen does when it gets mad.